Well, hi everybody. Welcome to Stratosphere Lounge. I'm your host, uh, Bill Whittle, the host and audience. Uh, also janitor, uh, you know, I pretty much do everything around here. Uh, it's good to be back. I think we've done three in a row, which is quite a record for the latest uh, couple of months or so, because um, this is episode number 130 of the Stratosphere Lounge, and it has been uh, busy. Um, very, very busy. I'm here pretty much every day, and that's okay, because, uh, you know, if you're in this line of work, then election season is Black Friday. It's Black Friday every day between now and November 9th, and, uh, you know, no one's um, no one's disappointed in terms of uh, interest here. It's been uh, just a crazy, nutty I- election. Um, you know, usually we start the show with just a couple little r- ramblings and, and musings before, um, before we get to the questions. Uh, there's two things uh, that strike me today. First of all, just give you a little um, sneak peek at the next uh, firewall topic. Um, you know, we this thing with Hillary Clinton and, and the coughing fit, and she disappeared for a week. Then she came back and coughed for four and a half minutes on Labor Day, got on the plane, um, surrounded by the press. They asked her those typical questions, that, you know, those tough, tough, hard-hitting questions they normally ask, like, how does it feel to be you, and uh, is this as much fun as 2008, and all the rest of it. And then she started coughing, and she went to the front of the airplane, and she... Um, she didn't come back. For those of you who've been uh, paying close attention to this, Hillary Clinton made an appearance not too long ago. She went into vapor lock uh, right in front of an audience, and uh, and the people, I mean, these weren't, I don't think they were Secret Service guys, but there were two guys out of there like like bullets, and this, this very large black man was behind her and kind of propping her up, and somebody else had the the little um, anti-seizure um, syringe thing. And you could see he had it in his hand. He was just about to give her a shot with it. And um, and, and he, you can hear this man in the background saying, right, so everything's okay, everything's fine, just keep, be cool. Uh, just keep talking. And she keeps talking, and, and off you went. Well, everybody noticed this, needless to say, and people were commenting on who's this guy, so we never saw him on the road again. He vanished, disappeared. However... Um, when you look at the video of uh, of her on the um, on the the campaign jet, she starts coughing. She can't stop. Goes forward um, towards you know first class or whatever, and then um, there he is. There this guy is. Uh, so a couple of people saying to Demis uh, one twenty nine. No one one twenty nine was last week, I think. Um, did I get that wrong? I don't know. I thought it. You know what? I don't care. I'll, I'll I'll sort it out later. It's either 129 or 130. So they'll let me know in a second here. I think I just uploaded 129. Anyway, anyway. Uh, so she goes up there and um and 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 she's gone. And that's when I realized that this that this is not just. It's not just that Hillary Clinton lies. That's just beyond. It's not exactly you know uh, late breaking news. But. What I realized was that there is a genuine. It's 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 out in the open. See, I, I fight. Uh, well, uh, well, the keeper of the gates with the flaming sword says this is 129 instead of 130. I, I I'm frightened and confused already. I'll probably just call it a night here. Turn off the camera and then I can go back and do uh, uh, do 130 the way I wanted to. Um, but here's the thing, Uma Habedin, uh her close assistant, said has repeatedly said in emails that Hillary gets confused easily and that she's uh, suffering from memory loss problems. Um, the, uh, her defense against the fact that she thought every single uh, email with a C was paragraph C instead of A and B, um, and, and she basically says, I don't recall anything before my head injury, which is a pretty desperate thing to say if you think about it. Now she had to decide whether or not she was going to re-perjure herself or whether or not she was going to go ahead and, um, and, and ratchet up the speculation about her health. But, but certainly Uma knows how, how sick she is. Um, without question, Bill knows how sick she is. Without question, uh, um, Chelsea knows how sick she is. I have a, uh, I have a friend who, who has very reliable evidence that, um, 
that she's just a, a just a complete alcoholic. She just passes out drunk at the end of the night. That those rumors have been going around for a while, but uh, there seemed to be some confirming evidence. And so here's the point of this next firewall. This is not just Hillary lying. It's a criminal conspiracy, because if you have somebody this ill, then they are not fit to be president. And if you have to have literally now, I'm not just exa- I'm not exaggerating, it's the truth. If you have to have secret service agents propping you up and, and somebody standing by with a hypodermic uh, in case you uh, have a seizure, and then in the middle of how many times has she done it now? Nine, 10, 11 times? Cannot, cannot continue her conversation because of coughing fits. That is somebody who has got a serious problem, and we have a right to know about it. And, and the thing, you know, there's so much to dislike about Hillary Clinton, but I have to tell you, the thing that I despise the most, the most, the most is watching her talk about her lying and, and that, that kind of fake smile, that fake cheeriness of hers. She, um, she went on Jimmy Kimmel, uh, proved to America that she's fit to be president by opening a pickle jar. Turned out that the pickle jar had already been opened. Think about that. Just think about that for a second. Uh, I don't know whether it was her idea or Kimmel's. Undoubtedly, it was Kimmel's. I'd be willing to bet it was. But in any event, she goes on to make fun of the fact that she's perfectly healthy by opening a pickle jar. And the pickle jar had been pre-opened because she couldn't open it otherwise. But look, there has to be 10 and there's probably 50 people who know how badly sick this woman is. I'm genuinely physically ill. Take her politics out of it completely just for a second. Just take away the fact that she's a felon and a traitor and a communist and all the rest. Um, there are large numbers of people, the, the people on board the, the airplane, all of the top campaign people. I just want to reiterate this because it bears, it bears hammering this point. Uh, when she came out late for that debate, that um, uh, Democratic debate, they said that she came out late because she was sitting backstage, didn't know where she was. A lot of people had said that she's confused. She doesn't know where she w- where she is. So this is what they're this is what they're foisting on us, and this is why I think it's a criminal conspiracy. We have a right to know what's wrong with this woman. Um, you know, you can say, well, medical records, fine. You know, okay, fine. But if, if you can't, if you have to miss, here's the really, the, the, the big kicker, right? If you have to miss the most critical three or four or five weeks of your life because you're too incapacitated, you need to be helped upstairs, then you're not fit to be president of the United States. And if it turns out that it appears to be true, and certainly there's a lot of evidence that it's true, that things like sharp noises or people talking at the same time or overexcitement leads you to have a small seizure, that's probably not somebody we want um, in, in the White House. So it is a conspiracy of people that know, the guy with the hypodermic knows, and Hillary knows, obviously, and Uma knows, and, and no doubt uh, the people that have been around her for so many years know that this woman's critically ill. And not just that, she's just plain nasty, throwing you know Bibles at people and kicking the back of the seat of the, sec- uh, the Secret Service driver and, and insisting that the helicopter go back because she forgot her sunglasses and she had something like 11 devices, 13 devices, all of which had classified information on them, six of which she lost. Well, where's your... your, your uh, BlackBerry, ma'am, it's got uh, it's got all of the national security secrets on your BlackBerry. Where is it? I don't know. I lost it someplace. Just give me another one. Okay. And you know, the, when when you've got staff members destroying iPads with hammers, you know, we say this again and again and again and again and again and again and again. If there was a press, none of this would be a problem. None of it would be a problem. And so we have to be the press. It has to be this, you know, it has to be shows like this and, and word of mouth and the internet. If it wasn't for the internet, we wouldn't know any of these things. So it's a criminal conspiracy to, um, to cover up uh, information that the American people have a right to know. They have a right to know about the Clinton Foundation. Uh, they have a right to know about the pay for play. They have a right to know about the, um, the uh, sickness. But here's, here's where my, my cynicism uh, and by the way, I'm not a natural cynic. I had that uh, just beaten into me over the last eight years. So here's the problem. We live in such a uh, media-intensive world that nobody believes anything now unless it's on camera. It's not that they don't believe it. It's just that they don't care. Uh, you, can, you can make that same case on a big scale, too. You know, the, the, the communists killed four, five, six times as many people as the Nazis under about as bad conditions. 
uh, in the gulags. And um, there are still people who cheer for communism and Bernie Sanders and guys like that. I think it's great. Uh, and the reason that the, that the, the Germans are rightly uh, um, condemned for this horror when the other socialists, the national socialists, are condemned for this horror, the international socialists uh, aren't. And the reason is because there's photographs of the Nazis and there's no photographs of the gulag. It's just that simple. If it, you know, you know pics, pics or it didn't happen. Um, and so when we get, you know, you get these things like straight up treason with, uh, with the email thing and the director of the FBI comes out and, and basically in the space of an hour uh, makes the case against her and then says that charges will not be brought, you are really in deep uh, in terms of the level of corruption and the level of just treasonous um, deception. Here's why I think all this is interesting. If Hillary Clinton gets into one of those debates and she starts coughing and she can't stop, then there will be pictures, right? Then there will be vis video evidence. A fair amount of the country doesn't even know this exists because the uh, Clinton News Network and all the rest of them are putting it out. Uh, like it never happened or and again this is Hillary's uh, defense you know she goes I think it was on Kimmel she says uh, I don't know what these wacky theories about my health are really yeah I think it's some kind of you know I don't know what what it is with these people some people just too much time on this kind of this weird conspiracy theory about um, about my health and it's like it's like listening to Hillary Clinton say that is like listening to Michael Jackson tell you that he's never had any plastic surgery it's like I know you're lying, and and we all know what the truth is, and you still are gonna you're still going to insult our intelligence and essentially spit in our face, Michael Jackson, when you say that no, I've never had any plastic surgery, uh, and these uh, three um, white kids with blue eyes and blonde hair are my biological children. Really, really, you expect us to believe it? Uh, so. That's basically what I'm going to be saying. It's not just her, her lying. It's not just her emails. It's not just anything. There are huge forces at work that have basically cut the tongue out of the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and um, caused news networks to go to black when, when one of their uh, anchors just kind of parenthetically says something a little bit troubling for Hillary. Boom, shh. Oh, well, it looks like we've lost uh, Suzanne. Uh, we'll try to get her back. Yes, yeah, sure you will. You, 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 oh. What are what is going on? Anyway, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be something. And by the way, what's you know what's the end game for her? I mean, I've I've maintained for quite a long time now that that she's only doing this for one reason and one reason only. She is doing it because she wants to show Bill Clinton. She wants payback for the years, the decades, the decades, almost half a century of humiliation that she's had to take at his hands and all of that meanness and all of that destroying other people's lives that she did just because they came forward about what her husband actually did to them. All of this rage and, and narcissism and, and, um, and insecurity and self-loathing and, uh, and, and pettiness and, and bitterness and just plain orneriness, this just desire for power and to tell people what to do, all of that, it just boiled and boiled down and got more and more nasty and sticky and tarry. It's like watching a lake evaporate and you're left with this ever more toxic uh, sludge of s pure salt and then even the salt dries up and you're just left with that white powder. That's kind of what she is. Um, so, you know, something is going on and we're going to find out. It's not like we're not going to find out. If she's elected president, this is not a temporary thing and it's not getting better. So what happens? I think she just has to, I think she just wants to be elected and sworn in. And I think if she got elected and sworn in and, and left office the next day, I don't think it would bother it at all. As long as she was in the history books, I think that would be um, enough for her. Uh, to show Bill and to show everybody else and, you know, this this thing. So in, in closing, let's just say uh, this. There's, there's a solid chance that she can be elected. There's a very good chance I think Donald Trump could be elected. It's looking better. And that's exactly right. Some some people just said it in the comment section. Steve Darrow s said it. It's exactly true. She, she wants to be the first woman president. And didn't we try this already uh, eight years ago? Uh, these Democrats think that we conservatives have a problem that we just
can't stand the idea of a black president or a woman president. I'm not opposed to either one of these things. I just think that the that the individuals that they picked were just appalling. Barack Obama's a, a, a mediocrity, a nothing that was raised by feral communists and, you know, and, and um, there's no question about that. That's not up for discussion. It's in his book that he wrote. Uh, and, and, you know, he's the only editor of the Harvard Law Review not to write a law review. I've mentioned this before, but uh, isn't it surprising? I was thinking about that for a long time. Bothered me for quite a while. I kept thinking, all right, I understand why you would, why you would um, hire him to make him the, the, uh, the president of the Harvard Law Review because he's black and he's well-spoken and good-looking kind of guy. So it makes Harvard look good and very progressive, and that's the main thing is to signal our virtue to everybody. But then I thought, why would they hire him? And then not, well, I mean, you know, put him in as the, accept him as the uh, president of Harvard Law Review. Why would they do that and then and then not have him write any law reviews? I couldn't figure it out for, for the longest possible time. It didn't make any sense to me. And then suddenly it did make sense to me. Here comes some of our hardworking individuals. Hey, Neil, we'll see you. Uh, he's busy sending out member benefits. Oh, my gosh, there goes Linda. It's, uh, it's getting to be like one of these goat rodeos. Uh, we're going to have a clown car back there and 75 people go around in a big circle. But... It occurred to me that the reason that Barack Obama, that, that the mystery of him not having written any law reviews is, uh, of course he wrote law reviews. Of course he did. Um, he wrote law reviews that were unreadable. He wrote law reviews that were so uh, sophomoric and, and, and simple-minded and, and, you know, just utterly mundane, but poor poor kind of reasoning for somebody who's going to, you know, uh, you know Fresno State uh, Law School, this kind of thing. And it's a complete embarrassment for Harvard. So Harvard just says, let's just keep him in front of the cameras and we'll just pretend um, that, uh, you know, that um, he is what he is. He's not. He's a mediocrity. He's, he, we, we could have had so many good people to be the first black president, and now we're about to do the same thing with with. We're going to have the first women. Don't you Democrats ever think of anything other than these kind of things? Couldn't you just get, would, wouldn't you rather have, instead of the first woman president, wouldn't you like to have the best president who is a woman? No, they don't care. It's all about, it's all about their, uh, their, their, their stuff. I, um, I saw the worst thing I think I've seen in two years, maybe the worst thing I've seen in eight years. Uh, it came out in April, um, I went to an actor's friend's page. I hadn't seen her in a while, and I just uh, was flipping through, and I saw all these posts, and um, and they had these uh, five or six year old girls, and they were basically dropping the f bomb everywhere, saying that yes, if you think it's offensive for me to say, you know, the f word, and they didn't just say the f word; they said the actual word then imagine how offensive it is that women don't get paid the same amount of money. So they're running with a unequal pay canard that's just completely disproven lie. And they're running with the um, one out of five women are going to be raped thing. These are six-year-old kids, and they're using the foulest language you can imagine. And they're doing this specifically to shock people and get their attention. I thought it was child abuse, and it is everything you need to know about, um, about the left. It's everything you need to know about them. Uh, false premise. Um, complete use of uh, emotion, uh, no factual data. In fact, factual data dis disproves their case. Um, you know, the, the corralling of children into, into their political agenda and this giant sense of, look how edgy and dangerous we are because we're using these bad words. I'll bet dad's going to be really upset when he finds out. It's just the most pathetic thing I'd ever seen, ever, 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 ever. Uh, I'm very tempted to to, to uh, post it, but it's just so obscene. There's just no way I can do that. And their their website is um, it's f, and then the word eight, but it's not just f. It's the f word and followed by eight, so it's hate. Get it? Um, that's a great way to go. By the way, don't you don't you know? Isn't that isn't that just perfect for them? They they don't even see the contradiction in that, right? What's your opinion? Fuck hate. Uh, uh, that sounds like a hateful thing to say. Um, they don't care. Uh, and um, my God, what awful people! It's it's things like it's things like this that just make me get me up in the daytime. 
uh, in the morning. It's the kind words I get from people like you um, that keep me going. And then it's things like this that kind of internally motivate me. It's like somebody has to stop these people. Somebody has to get out there and fight them. Um, it was ju It's just awful. And there's something else. I didn't prepare this uh, for the show, but it will take only a second to do it. I saw something on that same website. It was put up by a you know, lovely girl when I knew her back 20 years ago. But she's a, a slacker. Yeah, that's all there is to it. And, um, and she put up something that is maybe the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I'm just hooking up the audio for it now. We'll go bring it up and we'll talk about it for a second. I think that'll do it. Okay, uh, this is what she had on the website. Uh, and I'll read it to you just so, just so I can read it. Okay, so here we go. Apparently, this is a quote from Buckminster Fuller. He said this, We must do away with the absolutely specious notion that everybody has to learn a living. It's a fact today that one in 10,000 of us can make a technological breakthrough capable of su supporting all the rest. The youth of today are absolutely right in recognizing this nonsense of earning a living. We keep inventing jobs because of this false idea that everyone has to be employed at some kind of drudgery because, according to Malthusian Darwinian theory, he must justify his right to exist. So we have inspectors of inspectors and people making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. The true business of people should be to go back to school and think about whatever it was they were thinking about before somebody came along and told them they had to earn a living. If this is not the most ridiculous, I, I, it, it's so bizarre that I don't, I don't really know if I can credit him with it. it it's probably just trolling or something. Where do we start with this? Um, I mean, uh, where do you start? Well, we'll start at the beginning. That's where we'll start. So what, what, what is this thing really saying? Um, okay, it's the idea that people have to earn a living is, is specious. It's a, false, it's a false premise. It doesn't exist. Um, so w what does that mean? If everybody should be able to go home, at, you say at the end, go back to school and think about the things you were thinking about before you had to learn a living. And by the way, uh, Bucky, if this is in fact uh, your name, I mean, you find it a little telling that your sentence, your closing sentence, is to tell people to go back to school and think about what they were thinking before the world had to impact them? It's kind of like saying well, what, what they were thinking about um, My Little Pony, you know? They were, that's what they were thinking about, Bucky. They were thinking about um, Call of Duty, and they were thinking about a bunch of other things. They're thinking about just being able to sit on the couch for the rest of uh, their lives. And i um, not talking about everybody, obviously, but we're talking about the kind of people that use this on Facebook to justify the fact that it's, it's a, a defense and it should be illegal that they have to get out and get a job. So he says, it's a fact today that one in 10,000 of us can make a technological breakthrough capable of supporting all the rest. Okay, Bucky, what does that look like? I'm listening, uh, because if it's one in 10,000 of us, let me see. Uh, 1,000 is a tenth of that. Uh, 100 is a tenth of that. And one is a tenth of that. So 300 million uh, down to 30 million down to 3 million. So, you know, according to this, there should be 3 million people who are making technological breakthroughs every day that can support the rest. Well, here's, um, here's a, a technological breakthrough for you, Bucky. This is a, here's a technological breakthrough for you. It's called the iPhone. Ta-da! See? There it is. And it is perhaps the greatest technological breakthrough. It's certainly the greatest br technological breakthrough of my life. The idea that somebody said something about a... F uh, there goes Carla. Hi! Everybody's waving, except they're just waving in the past or in the future. Um, Somebody said, uh, some comedian, I wish I knew his name, said that he's getting to the point where a telephone is just an app on his phone that he doesn't use very often, the actual telephone part. Nobody likes to talk on the phone anymore. So, but, but Bucky, let's, let's follow your premise here. This ability that I have with this device means that I always know where I am. I never get lost. It means I have full access to everything that man's ever thought of. It's, if it's been written down, I can get to it. If it's ever been photographed, I can get to it. Um, it is the single greatest breakthrough of all time, and you're going to have to explain to me how that means that people can sit home and not work. 
it, it certainly makes sitting home and not working a lot more interesting than it used to be. But how does that technological breakthrough support all the rest of us? How, how can one in 10,000 people, 3 million people, 300,000 people, whatever number you want, how can they come up with technological breakthroughs that support all the rest of us? If I come up with a technological breakthrough in, in the iPhone, it doesn't, it doesn't mean I don't have to work, and it doesn't mean nobody else has to work either. People still have to be fed, and you still have to have an economy, because idiots like this genius have this idea that an economy should just be, you know, just do what you want to do, and 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 they don't understand that there's more to life than actually just getting food. Although you have to get food, we've done this before. Um, but Bucky, here's the deal: if I want to have some food on my table, you think I just have to, I have to go and um, and and persuade the farmer to give up some of it. But the farmer uh, gives up his food, and then the farmer gets handed off to a, a truck that bri- drives it into market. Somebody has to refine the gasoline for that truck. Somebody has to go out and drill the oil for the gasoline. Somebody has to make the rubber that that's on the tire. Somebody has to stitch together the upholstery. Somebody has to um, paint the truck, and somebody has to put a license plate on it. Somebody has to follow which license plate it is. Somebody has to stay on the side of the road to make sure that the car's not going to the truck's not going too fast. Somebody has to has to machine the hundreds of parts that are moving in the engine, and there's thousands of people that work on every one of those things. That, Thousands of people work on a pencil, for God's sakes, and something like one truck is a, is a practical army. Then they have to drive it down roads that have to be cleared, and they have to be graded, and they have to be um, paved, and then they have to be maintained and, 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 and get into the city where there has to be electric lights and traffic lights and all the rest of it. This is just to get your food to the table. This is just to do the one simple thing, the one simple essential thing, get food to the table. Same thing for water, by the way, at least out here. It's not just out here, it's everywhere. How many people watching the show drink water from a stream out back of their house? None. It's nice to have a clean water stream out back of their house, but if it's not none, then you have my deepest admiration and, uh, and envy. So just getting water to people in Los Angeles is an enormous technological deal that requires huge amounts of of effort and work and energy and all the rest. It has to come from someplace. So why on earth could you say something that stupid? He sounds like what he's trying to say is that one day we're going to invent a robot that's going to do all of our work for us. And um, and I think he really thinks that. He thinks, one. by the way, it's a fact today that one in 10,000 of us can make a technological breakthrough. One in 10,000 of us? The iPhone is not, is not one in 10,000. This isn't, this isn't one person's. One person didn't create this. This was created. It is absolutely true that one person had the vision for it. That is 100% true. Absolutely true. But to create it, I'm not saying that Steve Jobs didn't build that. I'm saying Apple built that. But in order to build this, you have to mine the metal and you have to, you know, you have to process the glass and you have to make the silicon chips and you have to have hundreds of people, thousands and thousands of people independently designing apps. So here's a technological breakthrough that's not supporting anybody. This doesn't feed me. It doesn't turn on the power. It doesn't uh, it doesn't run my life. It doesn't get me water. It doesn't uh, put uh, shampoo on the on the shelves in the um, in the bathroom. And it's such a st- stupid thing to say and it's so obvious why people why some people would would quote this and put it on their facebook page basically what he's saying is super genius uh, buckminster fuller said that it's a ridiculous that you have to go and work for for a living um and and here's another thing uh he says we keep inventing jobs get that we're inventing jobs we're not fulfilling jobs we're not fulfilling need we're inventing jobs um the youth of today are absolutely right in recognizing this nonsense of, of earning a living. It's nonsense to earn a living. Here, I'll give it back to you here. We keep inventing jobs because of this false idea that everyone has to be employed at some kind of drudgery. Who said drudgery? Because, according to Malthusian Darwinian theory, he must justify his right to exist. Getting a job and working doesn't justify your right to exist. Everybody has a right to exist. It's how you exist. Getting a job is how you exist. It's not justifying your race. It's not like, hey, I'm going to go to work so that I'm worthy of food. Of course you're worthy of food. But who's going to get it? How are you going to get it there? 
you've got to go and get it. And you've got to do the same thing for energy. You have to do the same thing for medicine and all the rest of it. And then he goes on to say we have inspectors of inspectors and people making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. Now, on this particular point, I agree with him because basically what he's doing is he is saying that the entire economy, the entire workforce is out there enforcing regulations that are written by people like this. This is, in fact, the cancer on a productive society, and it is the only thing that you can do that really genuinely doesn't do an awful lot of wealth creation. Some inspection is good, obviously, but this kind of you know micro, uh, this micro management of everything, it, you know, I, I, the whole package. And then I saw the video after that because it was on the same page, and it just made me realize, my God, my God. It is just amazing what some people believe. They had a, another one of these F-bomb things, and it was um, F-word assault rifles. Um, you know, ban assault rifles, F-word assault rifles. And it was worn by authentic gay people from authentic Orlando, some of whom had been in the nightclub when the shooting was going on, and one of whom lost a friend in there. And that's fine. And and I'm sorry you lost a friend, but uh, this is the other thing about the left that I simply do not, I cannot process. They seem to think that if you, if you made guns like that illegal, then no one would have them. And they seem to think that it's, it's a problem of education. In that video I was talking about with the little six-year-old girls using the, the most foul language possible, not just the F word either, the most foul language and the most vile ideas possible. They were talking about the rape uh, lie about one in every five women going to college gets raped. And it's just not, not even, it's nothing close to that. But basically what they're saying is, so stop doing it. Why, you know, why don't you stop doing it? If we could just raise awareness of it. This is, see, this is the thing. They actually genuinely believe that the, the problem with rape is a problem of um, insufficient education. If somebody would simply explain to the rapist that it's not the right thing to do, that it's bad, then we won't have any rape anymore. Because then they'll know, see, then they'll be enlightened liberals just like they are. Once they understand that it's bad, then, then they won't do it anymore. My contention is they already know that it's bad, and they don't care about what you're going to say or do about it. If you're going to go and shoot up a nightclub in Orlando and you're prepared to kill 50 people before you go down in a blaze of glory, I don't imagine you're going to be too concerned about parking in a handicap spot or parking in the red zone or parking in a no parking area. I don't think you're going to care if you're determined to go out and murder people with a gun or a truck or a, or a pressure cooker or knives or clubs or whatever. Clubs and knives kill four or five times as many people as assault rifles and, and um, bare hands and feet do more than, than, than um, semi-automatic rifles. But they don't, it just, it's simp I, I just have to have them, you know, sometimes when, you, when you're arguing with people like this, it's like when you're talking with people uh, who are like about the, the whole chemtrails thing or, or, or the, the moon landing didn't happen or any of this stuff. When, you're, when you have to explain to people when you're when you're fighting that kind of a of a a, a a theory of things, you can say all the sensible things in the world you want, and they're not going to listen to you. They don't understand. So what you have to do in a case like that is you have to make them explain their theory, make them explain their theory how it works, and then you've actually got them. Um, do you believe in the Loch Ness monster? I do. Okay. Uh, what evidence do you have of this? Well, there's been all these photographs that have been taken over the years, and there's a wake, and there's a 64 picture of a, got a good good look at its neck, and there's a couple of bumps in the water taken in 1972, and so on and so on. It's okay. So what do you think it is? Oh, it's one of those dinosaurs. Okay, it's a plesiosaur. Yeah, it's a plesiosaur, which is an air-breathing dinosaur, right? Yes. And since it breathes air, it has to come to the surface 10 times an hour, maybe more, right? It has to breathe, right? It has to come up for air, right? The entire surface of Loch Ness is, is, is watched by hundreds of these lunatics. We would see as much of the Loch Ness monster as we see of whales, because whales have to come up and breathe too, and whales are real. Um, so make them explain it, you know, make them explain their theory. I had got into a discussion with somebody about chemtrails, and I made her explain how it worked. You, she really believes that people 
are spraying poison out of jet liners in these in these persistent contrails up there, and and that the, that there's this giant conspiracy to poison people. Okay, explain to me how that works. This is going to the banning guns issue. It's not just off in the in the wild here. It's the same thing for banning guns. So just explain to me how the chemtrails things work. What do you mean? Well, how does it happen? Well, the jets are up there. You can see them up there, and they're and they're and they're squirting uh, these chemicals up there. And contrails didn't look like that before. Now they're now they're much more. Um, they stay up forever. It's obviously poison. There are chemicals in them. It's a chem chemtrail. Okay. Well, how are they sprayed? Well, they're sprayed out of airplanes. Well, there's a lot of contrails up there. On some days, you can see hundreds of contrails up there. So, are these military airplanes or are they civilian airplanes? Because if they're military airplanes. You've got a problem because there's hundreds of people like me, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of people on any given day looking out the window, and I'll often see a Delta jet go the other direction or whatever. So if there's a big black jet up there doing this, that's a problem. Finding large numbers of them are a problem. And even if you take away the whole military civilian aspect of it, she said, no, it's, it's, it's commercial jetliners. I said, okay, well, since I happen to be a pilot, um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something that's demonstrably true. You can prove it to yourself anytime you want to just at the airport earlier a uh, pilot on a commercial jetliner walks around his airplane either the pilot or co-pilot before every flight not at the beginning of every day but before every flight they're looking for things that are loose they're looking for uh, panels that might be coming loose or you know some things that didn't look like they were fully retracted or cracks in metal or anything like that they're, they're doing their job and it seems odd to me that given 40,000 flights a day in America and hundreds of thousands of pilots that not one of them has ever noticed the poison um, nozzles on the jet. It seems a bit odd to me. And it seems a bit odd to me that the maintenance guys who work on these jet engines haven't seen them either. And you know what else seems odd to me? If the purpose is spraying these chemicals up there like a crop duster, I find it very odd that that could be the case because in order to get the airplane to take off, they have to have a very, very concise uh, sense of the weight of the aircraft and the general balance of the aircraft. So if you're carrying along hundreds or thousands of pounds of, of poison and you're going to put it in the airplane someplace, then the airplane is not going to take off when it should take off because it's thousands of pounds heavier than the pilots know it to be. She said, well, the pilots are all in on it. Now, this is, I'm not making this up. Said, okay. All right, uh, that's that's interesting. Um, so 100,000 pilots or more, when you think about all the ones who've already retired and so on, two, 300,000 pilots are in on this? Yes. And not one, not one of these people who's been sent up to murder everybody in America, including their own children, not one person has said, boy, I got a funny feeling this isn't right. Well, they pay them a big, a big amount of money, and, and they threaten their families. If they don't do it, they'll be killed. This person is dead serious. I mean, she's dead serious. And, and then it became, okay, so um, make sure I get this straight. You've got a guy who's got a family of four. Uh, he's making pretty good money as it is, used to be anyway, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for a senior uh, captain. I don't know if it's that anymore, but it used to be. And so basically hundreds of thousands of these people, former veterans, many of them, if not most of them, former Air Force pilots who get, risk their lives to defend this country, are now being paid large sums of money, which they don't seem to be spending because I know a lot of commercial pilots, they don't look like they're spending large sums of money. And if you can't spend it, what's the point of it? To go fly over the, to, to go fly over the country and, and spread poison on everybody, including their own children. And to do what? What does this poison do? Is it designed to kill us? Because if it was designed to kill us, spraying it up at 35, 38,000 feet is not the way to do it. If you want to simply gas everybody in the country, you might want to do that at lower level. If it turns out that, no, no, it's, it takes a while for the chemicals to come down and kill people, well, then it comes down and kills the people that are doing it too, right? I mean, no, nobody's wandering around with gas masks on. You don't see the, the Koch brothers going from the, the, the limousine to the house with gas masks on to protect themselves from this poison that presumably they've uh, paid to put up there. And, and you just keep going on and on and on and on and on and on, and, and they simply... They simply just keep backpedaling because they can't, they can't get there. They, they have an emotional requirement to believe in it. It's got nothing to do with what actually happens. It's an emotional requirement. And then you close this argument by saying, 
could be all of those things. Hundreds of thousands of guys and, and mechanics and airplanes and, 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 and murder and, and, and kidnapping and, and extortion and, and, you know, assassination and threats. And it could be all of those things and it could be, it actually can't be because it can't be. It's physically impossible. On the other hand, uh, it is true that the contrails don't look the way they did prior to 15, 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more. So that's the proof. The proof is that there are contrails that are hanging around longer than they used to. That's the proof that you're using. That's the reason that you believe this, this boatload of nonsense. Uh-huh. How do you explain it then? How do you explain the fact that those contrails are up there when they weren't up there all the time before? I say, well, I explain it like this. A jet engine is an interesting device. There are many different uh, flavors of jet engines. They're all considered gas turbine engines. That's probably the best way to think of them. First generation of jets, the 707, the early 720s, in fact, all 727s, early 737s, you see one of the early ones. They've got the narrow little tubes underneath the wings, not the big round fans, the narrow little tubes like on the back of a 727 or underneath the wings of a DC-8 or a 707. And these are called, um, they're, they're basically called true jets. They're, um, they're turboprop, uh, uh, correction, turbo, they're, they're just turbojets. So basically on a jet like that, on the old style jet models, the air was sucked into the front of the jet, it was compressed, and then they squirted fuel on it. And this compressed air has a lot of oxygen in it. So when they squirt fuel on it and ignite it, it, it expands very rapidly. It can't go out the front. It can only go out the back. That provides a thrust in the equal opposite direction. And as the hot gases are coming out, it turns a turbine on the way out that keeps the turbine on the way in going. But basically, on all the jets, right up into about the 747, all the old jets, all of the air that touched the jet engine went through the jet engine. All of it went through the middle of it. And then somebody realized, you know what? We can get a jet a lot more efficient and quieter too, a lot more efficient. If instead of having all of the air go through this narrow bypass jet, instead of having all the air go through this drinking straw basically, how about if we do this? How about we keep that kind of jet. Okay, we keep a jet that, that's taking air through it because that's what a jet does. Takes air on one side, compresses it, squirts fuel on it, ignites it, and lets it come out the back end. But, but instead of that being the total amount of thrust, what if we hook this thing up to either a propeller, in which case you have a, a turboprop engine, or what if we were to hook it up to a turbine in the front that was much bigger than the jet engine? And essentially, when you see the fans, when you see the, the fans, when you get on an airplane, you see these, these little turbine blades, and basically, essentially, you're flying in an airplane that's, that's a propeller airplane with 30 or 40 or 50 blades per side. Now what happens? Well, what happens now is, yes, it's true, some air goes through the engine. But this volume of air that used to go through engines is microscopic compared to this. Now a little bit of air goes through the engine, but the huge majority of the thrust is air being generated by the fan, and the fan flows outside of the jet engine, and the amount of volume of air is enormously higher. It's enormously higher. And it's and it's uh, heated from the inside. Contrails are a result of, of condensation turning into ice crystals. So we call these new engines high bypass engines. And the reason we call them high bypass engines is because a lot of air that wasn't moving before is now moving through the nacelles but not through the jet. But it's coming out on the backside. It's surrounded. It is surrounding the hot gas. And so the volume of crystallized um, uh, water vapor up there is much higher than it used to be. And when you're dealing with ice crystals, the thicker the ice is, the longer it takes to melt. Any other questions I can help you with? <sighs> they don't. See, it's, it, this is the thing. I could have this conversation with them and, 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 and show them all of this, and it wouldn't make any difference because it's not rational. It is a, it is a, it is a, it's a psychological problem. It's a, it's a mental illness. This is the only way to describe it. It's a mental illness for people that have to believe something that is just patently not true. We, got, we did Facebook Live a couple days ago, Stephen Scott and I, and somebody said, so you actually believe we went into space? It's a kind of a refreshing change because normally we get, you actually believe we went to the moon. Um, yes, I do actually believe we went into space. How can you possibly believe such a thing? I could do this all night, you know. One of the reasons I believe we went into space was because when I was uh, 11, yeah, when I was 11 years old, I sat on the roof of my dad's uh, station wagon in Satellite Beach, Florida, and I watched 
Apollo 13 go off that pad and into the sky. I watched it happen. It wasn't very big. It was that big on the horizon. And when that thing lit up, its spark was so bright, and it took, a, it seemed like minutes before the <laughs> hit you. And when it hit you, you could feel it in your chest. And so I saw this giant rocket go up into the air. So if you're saying we haven't been to space, why do we need that big a rocket? What, where did these rockets go? Did they all just go splash in the ocean? You think somebody would have seen that. And if we're lying to the American people and we hate the Russians so much, or if the Russians are lying to the Russian people and we hate the Russians so much, then how come we don't just rat them out? It's just so much wrong with this that you just have to start to really wonder about their sanity. You genuinely do. Um, and it's the same. It's the exact same thing with this ban assault rifles or ban guns. Let's say that they had the authority, the legal authority. Let's just say they did it the right way, the, 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 the only honest way there is. Let's say there were enough votes to repeal the Second Amendment. The 28th Amendment says the Second Amendment to the Constitution is hereby repealed, and nobody can own guns anymore, and all guns are banned. And furthermore, let's give them everything they want. Not only are all guns banned, but all citizens are required to turn in their weapons, and if they don't, it's a felony. Now, let's just hold on to that thought for a second, because there's 300 million guns out there, or more, 400, 450, something like that. Let's give them everything they want. Let's give the, um, the F assault rifle, uh, what do you call these people? Let's give them everything they want legally. Guns are banned. All guns are banned. Not just assault rifles. All guns are, they're not only not selling them anymore, they're banned. And if you have them, you have to turn them in. So what happens then? Honest people, honest citizens who obey the law, some large numbers of them, some significant percentage of them will turn the guns in because they're law-abiding citizens. Most of the guns won't be turned in because the people who have the guns legally understand exactly what's going on there. They understand that this is exactly why they want the guns off the street. It's not to protect us against deer. It's to protect us against the government. But let's just say that, that, that half of the people in the country, let's just say that half of them turn the guns in. It's not going to be anything like that, but let's just say. So what guns have been taken? What, what do you have in your, in your giant gun warehouse now that you've gotten everything you wanted legally? What have you got in there? You've got the firearms of legally, of people who follow the law, and the reason we know they're following the law is because they just obeyed the law in order to turn the guns in. So everybody with their own guns who they've been using, you know, private citizens who used to go out there and practice shoot or, or hunt or whatever, now you've got their guns. But you know whose guns you don't have? You don't have the guns of murderers and rapists and robbers, that's why, or terrorists for that matter. You know why? Because if you're ready to break the law against murder, then breaking the law against turning your gun in is probably not going to deter you all that much. Are you really that stupid? Honestly, really. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They absolutely are. And that's why when they want to have, they want it in Texas, they did this, we did a right angle segment for members on this. Uh, they had a big protest, um, typical of, of left-wingers. is all about, you know, 11-year-old uh, kind of sexual crudity, the kind of thing that if you said, um, you know, at a, at a party would get you a lot of attention from the, from the adults. Um, and, and, and they say, um, we need to ban guns from campus. And the thing, I, the thing that just stops me and no one, I never hear anybody arguing this, by the way, because we are the party that just never can figure out how we, to explain all the things we know to be true. What makes you think that a person that's ready to commit mass murder, that a person has got it in them and is geared up and ready to go, and they're ready to shoot innocent people, little children in the face, what makes you think that somebody like that is going to stop doing that because he's realized that it's against the law. And how idiotic do you have to be to think that, um, that they don't realize that it's against the law to go in and murder people? So you're going to put a sign up now that says no guns on campus? What's that going to do? It's going to mean that the only people that aren't going to have guns on campus are the people that obey the law. And those are the only people that could ever save you. And if you don't believe me, you just go look at the first um, mass shooting in University of Texas, same place, where uh, I'll never, never remember his name. It's, um, it's, no, it's, it's not Mark David Chapman. That's the guy who shot Lennon. It's somebody. Anyway, it was the first mass shooter. He goes up to the top of the, of the uh, bell tower at the University of Texas, and he's a very good shot, and he's got a high-powered rifle. I think it was a... a, a 
I don't know, 30 out six, something like that. Anyway, he's got something with some real power to it, a hunting rifle with a scope, and he's up there, and he's just picking people off, and he kills 20 people. He's just a deadly shot. Well, what happens? This is back in 63, 64, something like that. Well, what happened is everybody starts screaming and running around, and the professors, yes, I'm talking about university professors, run out to their cars, and they open up their trunks, and they get out their hunting rifles, which they have with them all the time at school, and maybe some kids from the shooting club go and get some of their guns, and they return fire on this guy. And once people started shooting back, no one else was killed. Nowadays, we would those professors would be frantically running around looking for um, a kinkos so that they could mass produce flyers saying shooting people is wrong. And once the guy up there realized that, once he read the pamphlet. Once it occurred to him that shooting people was wrong, he'd stop. Same way that, it, that a guy who, who's about to rape a woman, you know, and do the most horrible thing to her, short of killing her, and in many cases probably worse than killing her. This guy doesn't know this is wrong. That's why we have to educate people about rape. Is that what you're trying to say? I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You know, there's a great line um, in Lord of the Rings, you know, what can... What can one man do against such re relentless hate? And sometimes it's like, what can one person do against such relentless stupidity? <sighs> but anyway, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about uh, before we get going. It's just got a little time tonight and didn't take too many questions. Uh, I don't mean to rub this in, but it is an interesting um, little discussion uh, springboard. And plus, I'm just looking for some excuse to show this picture. Uh, my understanding is that like two or three days ago, that show on Broadway closed. I think it's gone now. I saw Les Miserables on Broadway many years ago. I want to say back around 95, 96. But this particular production I saw in December of 2014, and then I saw it just about a month ago, two months ago, something like that. And I just have to say... Um, briefly because it's a nice different topic I just have to say that in my opinion uh, as a person who works in show business the broad that particular Broadway production of Les Miserables is simply the best thing I've ever seen it's it's the best thing I've ever seen it's not just the best Broadway show it's not just the best play it's not just the best story it's the best thing I've ever seen and and the reason it's the best thing I've ever seen is because it is magnificently put together with an enormous amount of work. The book and lyrics on that show are absolutely astonishing. But really, the reason that it works is you've got very, very talented people who made it into a musical, wrote the, the lyrics. The lyrics are incredible. The music's incredible. But what we were starting with um, in the Victor Hugo book is, is something so deep that when I... When I came out of there both times uh, in the last uh, 18 months, I came out of that theater with many interesting thoughts. One of them was, there's nothing in Les Miserables that's not covered. There's no human relationship that's not covered in that show. And in, in such a way as it just rips your heart right out of your body. The, the, the final 15 minutes of that show is, is you can just hear, when people aren't singing, you can just hear people sniffling. The entire audience is just weeping and sobbing. It's just, and, and they're weeping and sobbing because it's so beautiful and so sad. Every relationship is in that, is in that show. Every relationship, father, son, brother to brother, uh, brother to sister, uh, love relationship. There's a, you know, father, daughter relationship. There's, there's the, the relationship between the law and the lawbreaker. There's a relationship between grandfathers and their kids, a great relationship between priests and the laity. There's every single human interaction is in that show. And, um, and it is, it is just so magnificently done. I saw it on Broadway, I think. No, I might have seen the movie. I can't remember if I saw the show first and then the movie. I certainly saw the movie before I saw the show the second time, uh, six weeks ago. And the movie is so... I, I, I quite liked the movie when I saw it, but after seeing it again on Broadway, I, I realized it's so weak. You can't have people singing at the top of your lungs in movies. It just looks and sounds ridiculous. But those people on stage in Broadway are belting it out and when you belt out songs like that um, you know uh, one more day or um, bring him home or, or um, you know all of it it's it's just there's nothing like it 
I was singing um, I was singing the lyrics to Master of the House for four weeks. Every morning I'd wake up and just go, Master of the House. You know, just brilliant. The other thing I thought that was kind of interesting is, and then we'll let it go, um, both times coming out of that theater, the the level of emotion in there. See, emotion is not a bad thing. We were talking about all these emotional people and, and their ridiculous politics, but emotion is lovely and it's wonderful. You just have to know where it belongs, right? Getting real emotional and having your and having your emotional um, strings plucked by experts is a wonderful experience, but it's not a basis for politics um, or science or engineering or any of the rest of it. So. I came out of that show both times. I was so heavily moved both times by that show because right at the end they just hit you with this one line. It just sucks the wind right out of you. And the ending is spectacular. Whole show spectacular. And I came out of that theater thinking the same thing both times. I said, thought to myself, you know, we all think, all of us, including the people that are in here acting and, and performing, I don't think there's one person in, in 10,000, maybe in 100,000 people that has this thought we think about going into the theater and that the theater is a form of um it's it's like it's like a a kind of a different sort of reality like when we go into the theater we become different suspension of disbelief and all that other stuff uh and we look at the theater as like a place where you know you can go in and pretend however the strength of the emotions that a show like that generates to person has a soul in them the, the strength of the emotions and the and the variety of emotions everything has been has been ripped out of you you know you you laughed you 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 cried you felt envy you felt jealousy you felt passion you felt compassion you felt um, pride you felt uh, courageous you felt uh, you know sadness joy all it's all there and when you go into that theater I realized as I was coming out of the theater it's like we're actually walking out of the theater now and we're walking back into the real world and on some level on an emotional level the real world is the is the um is the stage the reality of what happens in that room back there is so much larger than what happens to us every day that you could make certainly make the case that you're only really fully completely human and engaged at least emotionally when you're being subjected to a show of that quality that kind of caliber you are you are taken places and you feel emotions that simply do not get into your head on, on any given day. And you can have sad days or happy days or good days, but you can't have all of these incredible feelings in three hours and not feel something quite remarkable. So uh, they, they, closed the, they closed that particular run. I'm so glad I went back to see it uh, before they closed it. And uh, it's, it's astonishing. Any good show does that. There's a screenwriter who, who made an interesting point. Uh, made a bunch of inst interesting points, actually, um, it's in story. And he's one of the many things he said that really surprised me as this person who's written seven or eight, nine screenplays. He says, it's common for writers to think that their audience is very stupid and that they're just going to follow along briefly. But he said, on the contrary, uh, audiences are brilliant. And the audience, as it's watching a mystery, is constantly doing calculations on who really did it. Is it this person? Yes, she looks like she could do it. But on the other hand, she's probably too likely. And, you know, it's a, and it really can't be that much on the nose. And they're just constantly going on. And they're doing a perpetual analysis of this. And when a member of the audience sees something on screen, this is what kills a movie. It's not like a bad scene or something. It's, a, it's, a, it's the moment when you sit there and go, oh, come on. That's when the movie's over. That's when it's dead. It's, it's when it's like, and you don't have to say it out loud. But when you just go, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Um, I just don't. I don't believe it. Um, I know we're all over the place here, but I love talking about this kind of stuff. It's cathartic for me. Uh, speaking of shows that are just so good that they make me happy and proud to be alive and, and all the rest of it, uh, I suppose by now I don't have to do too much, you know, panning around this place to show you, uh, you know, that there was a particular TV show I was rather fond of um, when I was a, a younger person, right? So I think we don't have to make that case anymore. Um, there is, there are a number of fan, uh, fan based Star Trek films. Um, my guess, I don't know the exact number up. It, I, I'm quite sure it's three and it may be four or even more, three or four different individual cases at various places around the country. Uh, Star Trek fans have, have built the bridge set 
and the bridge set is indistinguishable from the actual set. It's indistinguishable. Every single every single gumdrop light bulb is exact same color and exactly where it needs to be. And and I've seen a bunch of Star Trek fan films, and I've seen Star Trek Farragut and Excalibur, and I've seen you know uh, New Voyages and all the rest of it. And it's it's impressive, and it's it's it's. I admire the work that goes into them. Okay, so. So I admire, I admire the effort. I admire the, that's where the word fan comes, the f fanaticism of building a perfectly, uh, perfectly accurate reproduction of the Enterprise bridge off of the original blueprints. And, and, and I have nothing but praise for those people. However, there is one of these groups of people out there that are, that are on a different plane altogether. They are on a different, they are not doing the same thing. Uh, it's called Star Trek Continues. And the reason that these people are so much further away, and so much further ahead than everybody else, it's another fan-based movie. They've got some money there. And yes, they do get some of the old actors from the old show, and that's nice, and yeah, it's certain and kind of a real reality to it. But I'm watching this with, a, with, with my, uh, not with my Star Trek eyes anymore, I'm watching this with my writer-director eyes, and I'm, I'm looking at what they're doing. On Star Trek continues, okay, just this one. What Star Trek Continues is doing is they are lighting the show exactly the same way it was lit. You'd never light anything that way today. And the sets are constructed of the same kind of colors and textures that they, that they did in 1966, which you would never do today again either. Just look at the next generation. Everything's beige and, you know, and light gray. But in, in Star Trek, the original series, color TV was just starting to come out. And, and I mean, 64, 65 was in black and white. 66 was in color. I'm so, it's a miracle that Star Trek didn't have a black and white season. If they'd been out one year earlier, they would have. Um, but now you've got all these people out there with color TVs, and I'm one of them, you know, seven, eight years old, watching. I grew up in Bermuda. There's black and white TV because that's all the stations had. Two stations, four hours a day, black and white TV. So when I'd come to America and see color TV, I wanted to see color by God. And when you watch Star Trek, you saw by God color. Those skies were purple and 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 the and green and and red and the uniforms those red uniforms on the um security guys that is red and yellow and blue and all the flashing lights and all the special effects and the phasers and everything it's like color tv well these guys on star trek continues have re not, not only they didn't by the way they didn't just build the enterprise bridge they built the entire star trek set that means they built the curving corridors, they built the captain's cabin, they built sick bay, they built the bridge, obviously, they built all of it, and it is absolutely perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And happily, uh, and, and for a change, again, not to denigrate anybody else, but I've seen these other shows, and, and they're fan films, and, and we know they're fan films because the fans are in them, and the fans are playing the leads, and, um, and what it is is a guy who's really dedicated a lot of time and effort to have the fantasy of being Captain Kirk or, or being in Star Trek, and he does it, and good for him. Uh, really genuinely good for him. I don't mean that in a flip way, because I went to a lot of trouble to do it for the Dowd conundrum. I have pictures of me sitting on a pretty damn good uh, CG Star Trek bridge, and I it was one of the high points of my life. However, um, these guys on Star Trek Continues can actually act, except for McCoy. Everybody else is very good. Uh, McCoy's shockingly bad, uh, but everybody else is great. And the best part of all is that the guy who, who's behind this whole thing, I don't remember his name now, he's got an odd kind of a last name. Apparently, the backstory on this guy, I, I've heard this third hand, is that he, he'd been a Star Trek fan since he was 11 and had this in mind his entire life. However, the guy who plays Kirk on Star Trek Continues looks so much like William Shatner that there, if you watch a 58-minute episode or whatever they are, 53-minute episode, I guarantee you, if you're a fan of the show, there will be 10 times at least where you will you literally catch your breath because you think, oh my God, it's Kirk. He looks so much like him. And, and when the lighting is just right and the hair is just right and the uniforms are perfect, there are time and time and time and time again where you think, my God, they've done it. And it's the little things. So I was mentioning the lighting, right, that the lighting was, um, was lit the way that they would never light it today. 
You know what else they did that they would never do today? They shot it in four to three format, which means that they didn't they didn't shoot it widescreen. They shot, it's almost square. It's a little bit wider than it is tall, but it's the old TV format. And when you look at it on a on a high definition monitor or high definition TV set, there's black on the sides because the picture's not going out wide like a widescreen TV would today. All the all the uh, shows on TV now are in this kind of HD widescreen, but they didn't do that. They kept it a squarish three to four ratio. Um, aspect ratio and and it is important it feels uh, yeah thanks Vic um, Mignor, Mignona Vic, Vic Mignona I think he's a bloody genius and he's a good actor and he has got he's got the kind of passion that the Red Brothers had as far as I can see so he he looks like Kirk he, he can really act and um, and they shot it these are the last two things I'll say about it Mignana, thank you, Tim. Vic Mignana. Um, here's the, the things that are the subtle things that matter. They shot it in 4 to 3 ratio that nobody else is doing because it never occurred to them. That's the old ratio. It's the ratio that the original Star Trek series was shot in 4 to 3. So it's a very square picture compared to what we're used to. And then in the ultimate stroke of genius, genuinely the, this is the ultimate genius of these guys. Because... Because special effects have gotten so much better and so much just infinitely better than they were with these old optical effects, they, I think it was CBS or somebody, they remastered the original series show and they updated all of the graphics on the show. So when you used to see the Enterprise in orbit, you still see the Enterprise in orbit, but the planet looks so much better and the Enterprise has got more detail and the Enterprise can fly right past the lens and the planet um, killer has is, is been buffed up and all of the special effects were buffed up and made more modern looking in the remastering of the Star Trek series. It was about 10 years ago, something like that. And, and if, you're, if you're a fan and you've seen all the old episodes hundreds of times and then you see new special effects, it's kind of cool. It's like, wow, check it out. That's what we would look like if we did it today. But this genius, this genius... Minona, the genius, took computer graphics that can do all of this stuff, and he held his fire, and he shot the Enterprise the way it was shot before. He shot the, the close-up shot on, on, the, on the Enterprise when it's traveling through space. Let me see if I get these angles right. It, it actually looks like it's mushing through space. It doesn't, it doesn't, the angle's not right. It's like mushing its way forward. He shot it that way. You get the shot from behind the pylons. He, he reproduced, here's what, he, he dumbed down his effects. He basically had the, a, a giant tool shed of all these things that he could have done, and he held himself to the kind of things that were done. That's, that's really, 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 really smart. Really, 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 really smart. I was so impressed by that. never realized it until I saw it. And then I realized, okay, this guy's got it, man. He wants something real and he built it he's he's got an enterprise out there he's got the bridge he's got the corridors he's got sick bay he's got the costumes he's doing all this stuff and um good for him i just got one last question on this i'll talk about it real quick uh any feelings about star trek axanar axanar and the lawsuit it turns out that the people that own star trek i guess it's paramount is suing one of these fem films called Star Trek Annex R, which is also very well done. I don't like it as much as I like Star Trek Continues, um, but they're going after him. And I think the reason they're going after him is, that number one, they want to do a feature film, and th that particular Star Trek spinoff suffers from the same thing that just about all of the other ones do, and that is that the people have, who have the people who have gone to the trouble to get the money build the sets, paint the sets. They put five years, ten years of their life into this. They sew the costumes. They do all of this stuff. And they, and they have a bunch of friends helping them. It's like, hey, kids, let's put on a show. And they go, they fix up the barn and all of that. With the exception of Star Trek Continues, even Annex are, to some degree. The, the person who's done most of the work gets to play the captain. Either they play Kirk or they play another captain or the captain of the Farragut on Star Trek Farragut or whatever. And they're just not very good actors. I hate to be the person to tell them that, but it, it, they're not. And they, and they hire their friends. And their friends aren't very good actors. And they don't hire their friends. The friends are the people that help put the bridge together. They were the ones who were wiring this thing at 3 o'clock in the morning. And they want to be in the show. By God, let them. This is, their, this is their moment to be in Star Trek. However, 
when you see when you when you lack the discipline to do it the way it should be done and you do that with your friends then all of a sudden you find out that you know the average weight of a starfleet officer is you know 280 pounds or something and uh and they're very old and they can't act and and they didn't make clothes that big I don't mean to be, you know, a jerk about it. I'm just saying it doesn't look like Starfleet to me. Everybody in Starfleet was fit, and that was part of the future. It was part of the future I was sold, and I think there's something to that. In any event, uh, addicts are I know, um, I know a, a good bit about. I know a couple people in that movie, um, and that is using enough professional actors so that Paramount's actually going to sue them for the, is trying to sue them to shut it down. I saw the uh, trailer. I think it was for XR. Um, my friend Gary uh, Graham is in that. Sean Young, who was in Blade Runner, is in that. Ed Furlong, who um, who was the, the the kid in Terminator Two, was in it. And uh, I think well, certainly uh, Chekhov comes back. Walter Koenig, and, and I think Tim Russity was uh, the the Vulcan on uh, Voyager, and a lot of real names in there. So you got real big actors in there. And then now they're talking about suing these guys. It's a gigantic mistake. It's like if you ever tried to sue everybody that ever did a lightsaber battle on Star, you know, on, on YouTube. These are their fans. They're not going to be making any money off of this. You know, they're not going to be raking in the cash. And by the way, what you want is you want people out there keeping this thing alive. You want people out there keeping the universe alive. Star Trek, Star Wars nearly died. Because there was a long break between the first three and the second three, and then the second three sucked, and they rebooted it. But, you know, it was in pretty deep. Anyway, that's probably enough about all this stuff, but uh, sometimes I get excited and go wandering around a little bit. So let's see what we got here. I'm going to um, have to either speed these up or do some of them next time. Here we go. Um, Dustin LeBrand uh, asks, uh, Hey, Bill, I'm a bit of big fan of yours for a long time. Thank you very much. My question is as follows. I'm a conservative college student and I have a conservative talk show on my university's campus radio station. What do I need to be doing to support the cause of freedom and liberty and promote conservative values? Thank you. My advice to you, uh, Dustin, would be to go to your college campus and start a conservative radio station. That's what I would advise you to do. Um, It is incredible what you've done it's, it's a nice segue from what we were talking about with the star trek thing Th- you you are doing everything you can do and more um it's a it's a tough road to hoe and i've been um i've done a bunch of college campuses and done some turning point usa stuff going to be doing more with them i'm going to do a six video set with uh with charlie kirk and turning point usa they're making some actual traction out there um but I know how hard it is uh, to be, you know, conservative out there. And, and, and forget the politics. I know what it's like to be, you know, one out of 100. I know what it's like to be the, the odd ball there and the odd duck and, and, and take all that, you know, abuse from people who don't know what they're talking about. So just the fact that you're – if you were just a – if you were just a conservative who was talking to students about conservatism, I would say, man, good on you. Uh, I am I am 100 percent yours. Um uh, but the fact that you've got a radio station and you're broadcasting this to everybody is absolutely phenomenal. And I think given the uh, ex- given the effort that you've already shown, the fact that you've called in on the on the show here, wrote in on the show, uh, the, 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 just the guts and the moxie it takes to do that, I will tell you right now, I would be delighted to be a guest on your show. You want to do an hour? I'll do an hour with you. Absolutely. You just, my pleasure. Um, you'll have to send an email to info at billwhittle.com, I-N-F-O, and you can probably get the rest of it, info at billwhittle.com. It'll go to Carla. Please uh, tell her that you're uh, the, the guy who's got the college radio show, and I talked about it on Stratosphere Lounge, and that uh, Bill promised you an hour that is pretty dear to him, especially in this time of year, but you're going to get it. I'll give it to you this week if I can or next week at the latest. Um, it's the least I can do for you. Dustin, it's the least I can do for you. That's remarkable courage, initiative. It's um, it's everything I admire about people. Dave Wellman said he had a radio show in college. A couple people did. It's really kind of nice. But, uh, yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Uh, it'd be my pleasure to do that for you. So definitely get in touch with us, and, um, and we can talk uh, for an hour. So uh, 
And if you want to do, well, it's a radio show. Yeah, I've got a good face for radio. So uh, all I can tell you in terms of doing more is just, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up. Um, you know, the when, when Ice, T, uh, is it Ice Cube came out for Trump? I think it was Ice Cube. Um, when he comes out for Trump, he's doing what you're doing, Dustin, and he's doing something very, 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 very important. I've talked about social proof many times before how the single greatest psychological lever on people is the desire, it's, it's ingrained in just about everybody, to do what everybody else is doing and not to be seen as different. Uh, it is incredibly deeply ingrained in people. You will watch people in a line that is doing that are doing things or the literally mind-boggling thing, and it's an experiment. And the one person who's not part of the experiment that the, the experiment's about will do virtually anything that the, the the people around them are doing. They just it's obviously got some kind of evolutionary advantage. That's why it's there. But but it's deep. And what um, what you're doing here is you and, and guys like um, Ice Cube and, and a few others, is you're giving people permission to vote uh, Republican or for Trump or conservative or whatever. You're giving them permission. And that may sound like an odd thing to say, but it's not. You are basically um, the boy at the end of the line in uh, the emperor's new clothes, and you're saying, no, I know, I know you're all telling each other that this is great. And I know you believe that this is great, but I'm here to tell you there's a different vision and, and, and a better one. As some people are going to listen to that. And there are a lot of people who'd be sympathetic with you and who are sympathetic with you. They just can't show it in public because they, they can't be the person who's not doing what the line is doing. So, um, you know, tremendous moral courage on your part, Dustin. Uh, uh, a fair amount of physical courage as well these days, I'm sorry to say. But, yeah, it would be an absolute honor for me to do an hour with you. If, uh, if you send it to info at billwhittle.com, uh, be a real absolute pleasure of mine. And, um, and I take my hat off to you. If I was wearing a hat, I would take it off to you. Good for you. Um, okay, moving on. Dave Olson, that scalawag, uh, writes, It's depressing enough that our moral and intellectual inferiors keep peddling the fool's gold of socialism despite a century of failure. But it's downright mortifying that so many people keep buying it. To make matters worse, our side, which should be fighting and trouncing these charlatans, seems to be suffering from the political equivalent of a combination of battered spouse and Stockholm syndromes. Is it time for young conservatives en masse to forego the more lucrative career paths and enter education, media, and government to reclaim them for liberty? Superb question. David, expect nothing less from you. There's a lot in there. Um... First of all, people buy socialism because, they, because they've they been told to buy it. As we've said many times, when you ask people about what they believe, and they'll say, we're socialists because we love people and we care and we don't want to see poor people and all the rest of it. Um, but when you ask them how they be, when, when you observe how they actually behave, they're, they're rock rib capitalists. I've said the thing about the cell phone so many times, it's might as well be engraved in Mount Rushmore. But if you ask kids to s give up their cell phones to redistribute their wealth to somebody else, all of a sudden they're rock rape capitalists. So they've never been told anything different. And um, and uh, the, the Turning Point USA videos I'm going to do, I was thinking about this because it's for young people, you know, and it's like uh, I was thinking I might come out with my pants around my knees and a hoodie and, you know, sunglasses and a lot of, a lot of bling around my neck and lay down some fat beats. No, obviously the the worst thing you can do when you're trying to talk to uh, teenagers or college-age kids is to try to look like you're one and to try to look like you're talking down to them or talking to them as if they're not normal people. So that's not going to happen. However, I did give it a fair amount of thought before I called Charlie Kirk back. Well, I'll be working for Charlie someday. Um, and I said, Charlie, here's here's how it looks to me. Because he wants to do videos and he's doing great work to, to, to relight these fundamental ideas on college campuses. And I said, Charlie... I think this is my take on it. Um, I don't think anybody really is against freedom. I know there's some people against freedom of speech, but you can sell freedom. You know, nobody wants to be told what to do, and nobody wants to be forced to pay for things that they don't want to buy, and so that's actually not the problem. I think, personally, I think the problem is that so many people consider themselves socialists because they don't, it's not even they don't even understand any history. It's because they don't understand economics. That's why. Um, they don't understand economics. They don't understand the fundamentals of economics. Forget the, the, the nuances of it. 
So what I'd like to do is I'd like to do three videos and then we open it up to four. And I said, I think the first video I'd like to do is on money. So everybody knows what money is, but nobody, but none of them know what money really is. They know what they know what money is, but they don't know why money is. And I'm not going to lay out all the scripts for all of these things here right now. Um, but I will say this: I did have one of those electric shocks, one of those diamond bullets right between the eyes, kind of things uh, when when I was thinking about this. And it's a very profound thought that I've never heard anyone talk about. I've heard people use the expression, but not not in this in this way. And if you're talking about um, reaching college kids who have been heavily taught about socialism, and you start with money, the one thing I would start with is to say, money doesn't care who owns it. You get that? Money doesn't care who owns it. Money goes where it goes. And there are no dams or rivers or sluices or, or, or anything. There's no artificial channels to prevent money from where it should go. Well, there are some by the government, but as a general rule, if dollars are going to flow to um, uh, Taylor Swift and if dollars are going to flow to Beyonce, they're not going to stop flowing to Beyonce because she's black, and they're not going to pay less money to Beyonce because she's female or any of this other stuff. The money doesn't care who owns it. It is, it is a liquid, and it goes where the demand is. It goes where people want it to go. Money goes where you want it to go because that's what money is. People don't really understand it. John Condon just got it right on the neck, and that's exactly what I was going to say. I think your phrasing is better than mine, but this is precisely the point I was about to make. Um, money is, is something we give you in exchange for your work, but, but John Condon's, that's actually much better. He says, uh, money is liquid man hours. I am writing that down, pal. Um, that is absolutely the way to express what I've been trying to say to to these people. That is a superb phrase. What does that mean, money is liquid manpower? Well, what it means is if you mow the lawn for money uh, and you do it for four months, you can't take the four months of lawn mowing someplace else and trade it for what you want. You can't do that. So you have to take money for it. Um, and money is, in fact, it's it's liquid. It's liquid manpower. It's also it's also frozen manpower. It takes work that you do during a period of time, and gives you a, an item for trade that you can trade with for other people's work, for what they produce. It's the old I'm going to go to the to the spears and baskets thing. But basically, um, basically, you need money to buy a spear because because you can't always bring the spears. You, you can't carry everything you need to trade with you in your pockets. You, you know, if, if, a, if you go to um, a, you know, a pharmacy and the pharmacist wants to put a, a new extension on his house and you mow lawns for a living and you go down there and buy some drugs from this guy, some prescription drugs, you can't bring a wing of a building there and you can't do that. You have to bring something that represents what you've done. So yes, money is, a, is, is, what, is what you get in exchange for the work that you do. And money doesn't sit still, but money doesn't care. It doesn't care who owns it. It doesn't care and it's never cared. Um, money goes where the demand is. And once you understand that, you begin to realize something. And that is that the, all of this talk about income inequality if money goes where it wants to, if money goes where the demand is, and if money doesn't care who owns it, then you have to start asking yourself, hey, wait a minute, you know what correlates with income inequality really well? Is outcome, is output inequality. It's a one-to-one -one correlation virtually. There are some people with a lot of money who don't do any work, and there are some people that do an awful lot of smart, valuable work that don't get any money, but as a general rule, the more output you have, the more money you take in. The more money you take in, if you're smart, the more you get to keep and the more you get to amass. And when you get to a point where you have enough money, spare money, that you don't need every day to live on, then if you've got a half a brain, and I don't, but many people do, then you will find that your money actually goes and works for you while you're sleeping. Your money is actually out there working for you while you're asleep. Because the money is water, but it's also valuable, and it has value, and you don't have to do anything other than to let it go where it wants to go. One of the most amazing books on economics I ever read is uh, 
The Richest Man in Babylon. It's old book. It's been around a long time. And um, it talks about a guy who starts as a slave and then he buys himself his freedom and then he becomes a merchant, I think, and then he becomes, you know, practically becomes an emperor from nothing, from zero. And the fundamental premise that, um, that the richest man in Babylon uses is pretty simple. He says, for any $10 you make or 10 florins or 10 rupees or 10 pounds or 10 euros or 10, you know, ducats or 10 whatever, 10 shiny rocks, 10 seashells, whatever. He says, for every $10 that you bring in, spend nine. And that's really it. Because he says, if you only spend nine out of every 10, then that, that, that one out of 10 continues to grow. And when it gets big enough, then it, you can, it, it will go out and work for you. You can lend it to somebody reliable and they'll pay you it back, plus they'll give you more money. And when you've got more money, now you can even go to bigger projects. And that's how it works. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, it's just absolutely, you know, fantastic. Uh, Dave Big Booty there is something, Big Boot, Big Boutet, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's really profound. And this is the, it's funny he mentioned brain surgeon because it's a, a great example why is a brain surgeon get paid so much more than a janitor? Why? Well, it's not because the brain surgeon is a better person than a janitor, and it's not saying that his economic value is not the same as his spiritual value, his emotional value, or his human value. They've got nothing to do with each other. But we're talking about economics, so let's talk about economics. Why does a brain surgeon make so much more money than a janitor? And the answer is because the brain surgeon is much, much rarer. He's more rare. There are fewer of him. What that means is, in a country of 300 million people, there's probably 200 million, at least, two, probably 250 million people that could do the job of janitor. Now, that's not to take anything away from janitors. I have enormous respect for janitors. I'll tell you a quick little story about a janitor in a second. That means no disrespect for them at all, but the fact is 250 million people out of the 300 million people in this country could be a janitor. So there's a large group of janitors out there. There's not 250 million c- people could be the brain surgeon. I think even liberals can understand that, right? I think liberals can understand that it is harder to be a brain surgeon than it is to be a janitor. It takes more work, it takes more time, it takes more brains, more effort, and it takes a lot more education. Now, that's why a brain surgeon is worth more than a janitor because there are millions of potential janitors, but there's probably a handful, tens of top brain surgeons, guys like... Um, Ben Carson level brain surgeons. They have talent. And if you have a problem with that, then you can ask yourself, well, okay, if you don't like the idea that a brain surgeon makes so much more money uh, than um, than uh, a janitor, why are you okay with the fact that Beyonce makes $25 million and pays her dancers what? I don't know, a couple of grand a, a week maybe? Why is it okay that, why, does, why is it okay that um, Taylor Swift makes more money than her backup singers? Why do you buy albums that say Taylor Swift is not just Taylor Swift. I mean, there's musicians on that album, and there's backup singers, and there's people that printed up the artwork. Why, why don't they all get an equal share of the money that Taylor Swift gets? Why does Taylor Swift get all the money, and, and not the people and the recording engineers and the guys that made the plastic? Why don't they all get more or less the same amount of money as Taylor Swift does? Well, because every one of them is replaceable except for Taylor Swift. She's the only one that cannot be replaced. They are there to serve her. She is the product. And that's where the demand is. They don't pay Taylor Swift less because she's a woman. And they don't pay her more because she's a woman. They pay her exactly what she's worth. And we know this because money goes where it wants to. And money doesn't care who owns it. I think even liberals can start to get this in their head. I I had a chance to play this on um, a real audience. I was talking about income inequality. And the guy was talking about the difference between pay between a dean and a professor. And I said the dean can do things that the professor can't do. But the professor... the, the dean can do things that the professor does, but the professor can't do what the dean does. These were engineering students. That's an outrageous thing to say, he said. It's not outrageous at all, I said. If you're the dean of the engineering department, then you have to know engineering. It means you had to have been an engineering professor at some point in your life. Now, does that mean that he can do what the engineering professor does? Yes. Can the engineering professor do what the dean does? This kid says yes. I say no. The job of a dean is to go to cocktail parties and schmooze with people and shake hands and raise money. And I know engineers and I know engineering professors, and you do too, and they ain't very good at it. So there's very few engineers who are wonderful people, my favorite people, 
there are very few engineers that have the ability and the social skills to go out and do what the dean has to do. That's why he gets paid more money, because he's rarer. There are a lot of engineering professors, but there's very few of them that are people people enough to be able to go out, raise money, be able to interact with the professors, untie all the emotional knots. And if you think it's tough with engineers, you try it with theater people. It's, it's scarcity. It's rarer. I t- said I told you a story. I'd tell you a story about a janitor real quick. Um, I have not been a terribly neat guy my entire life, and I always beat myself up over it. I always say, oh, I should clean up my apartment. I clean up the apartment. It's only 10 minutes if you keep on top of it. I hear this all the time. And for my entire life, I just kept saying, oh, i got to, you know, I'd be just whoosh, 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 whipping myself for the fact that the apartment was always kind of a mess. And then suddenly dawned on me, um, there are people that will do this for you, and at a relatively reasonable fee. Um, so... I got a housekeeper come in one hour, or probably two hours a week, and now the place is immaculate. And the laundry's done. I don't have to waste time doing laundry, which I hated. They do that too. And I pay her a large cash tip in addition to the money that she charged. But here's the true story. This woman was a young mother, Mexican woman, I think, a legal immigrant to this country, and she was working for um, a housekeeping service. And because she was working for this housekeeping service, I don't know what they were paying her, but it's got to be in the neighborhood of 7 to $10 an hour. I can't imagine it was much more than that. So she's an employee. She's just a wage slave like everybody else. Um, and she goes out and works for the people and cleans their stuff and does all the stuff that, that liberals consider to be so degrading and so awful and so on. But this particular individual apparently didn't get the memo about how degrading and awful it was. She has many kids, I want to say five, six kids, and she's really really quite young. She may even be a grandmother. Her kids are going to college, and she's helping them go to college. So she works for seven, let's just say it's seven dollars an hour or ten, let's just say it's ten. She works for ten dollars an hour cleaning up after other people, and, and everybody thinks, oh my god, that's just so horrible and demeaning. Well, she didn't look at it that way. She quit the company. Um, and that upset me quite a bit because we'd had a number of different housekeepers there from this company, and she was terrific. And I really didn't want somebody new. I, you know, I, want, I didn't want to have to explain everything again. You know, I, I, my socks have to be folded in a very precise way before they're hung up on their little hangers, and and I got to get things exactly right. Yeah. So, um, so, she quit, and she's got a family, and she's not at this point, rolling in cash. She doesn't have vast reserves. She doesn't get to go paint for six months and, or go back to school. She's got to make some money because she's got a family to feed. But she quits the job. She quits the job. And I, when I found out that she had left, I said, how can we get a hold of her? And the company wouldn't give me her, her number, obviously, and I, I can understand that. But fortunately for me, uh, she was gone for about three or four weeks. She mailed me um, a letter to my home address, which is not my business address. I get all my mail at my business address, so I check my home address probably once a month, genuinely. And I see a letter in there that was three weeks old from her. And it said, uh, Dear Bill, uh, I just wanted to let you know I've left this uh, company and I've started my own company. I really uh, enjoyed uh, you know, uh, doing your apartment for you. You're very generous and uh, a really nice guy. And if you would like, uh, if you'd like for me to come back and do this, I'm starting my own company. I said, no, s- sign me up so I called her immediately and she was went through the process of getting incorporated and that took a while and we had to do our billing and we had to you know I'm a target I can't go hire illegal immigrants uh, it's wrong and, and it's illegal and that, so we had to she had to get a corporation we had to figure out all this stuff get all this stuff straight and she wasn't very good at that I'm not very good at it either but she got it done and um, and then uh, now she's got this company, and she's working. She's still cleaning. She's still cleaning apartments. Um, a couple of uh, months ago, she said that she had two other people working for her now because she's got more work than she could do. And about two weeks ago, she said, um, "I just want to let you know uh, the business is doing really well. Uh, we also provide handyman service. Uh, so if you ever need anything mounted on the wall, or if you need shelves put in, or you know somebody to." mount a TV on the wall. We do that. And, um, and we also do like big industrial stuff. If you're, if you're just, um, if you're about to leave an apartment and you don't want to clean the apartment up, if you don't pack your stuff and not forfeit your uh, security deposit, we, we do that. Uh, we, we do all kinds of things. And I said, Eileen, you're, you're everything that I believe in. You're, you're everything I believe in. This is, you are, 
you're the proof of everything that I believe in. And I was I was so struck by this. She's going to be a millionaire. She is. She's got people out there who are working very hard, and she's working very hard, too, like most entrepreneurs. This is my company. You may have noticed the staff left at 6.30. It's 7.40. I'm still here. Uh, but she is she is friendly, modest. She's efficient. She's honest. Returned money that was lost someplace back somewhere. Many cases where she just presented something that she had no, no, I didn't even know it was gone. And she presented it and, and asked, you know, it's just, just a terrific person. That is, that is being, um, is, there's uptake of that attitude into her little company. And then it's not so little anymore. And then the next thing you know, it's a big company. And then the next thing you know, uh, we're going to open up one of these in um, San Francisco, and then we're going to open up one in Chicago, and then she's going to be the company that she used to work for, and she's going to make millions of dollars. I have no doubt about it whatsoever because she didn't look at it as degrading, and she didn't look at it as a dead-end job, and she didn't look at it as something that was, you know, the end of the line or the bottom of the barrel. She never, she never behaved that way. She just was friendly, enthusiastic, did terrific work. She did great, great, great work. And from the beginning, I, I left her a large cap t cash tip because I always felt, you know, I felt that same kind of thing. You know, this poor woman is struggling and so on. But you know, she's just, she doesn't need, um, she doesn't need that anymore. She's going to keep getting it because she's one of my favorite people. But this is exactly right. Legal immigrant to the United States, working mom, um, working for, for the man, you know, for the company. And she's making $7 an hour and has the guts to quit and has the hard work and the initiative to go after all of her former clients and get hired and then get doing again and then spend more hours and she doesn't know if she's going to make this thing at work or not and and next thing you know she's hired her friends or, or relatives or something because they've got more business they can handle than they hire their uncle or their cousin or their nephew because now we can do handyman work and the next thing you know this this hard-working smart brave courageous wonderful woman is feeding I don't know Right now, she's probably feeding uh, uh, seven, seven or eight people are getting paychecks from her, and it's going to be fifty, and then it's going to be five thousand. It's you can say that it's not fair because other people don't have that initiative, but that is not something that can be corrected out of society. All you can do, if you, if the fact that most janitors don't take that risk and you're saying that's not fair, then all you can do is cripple the ones that do take the risk. Because if they're not going to do it, if they can do it, if there's nothing stopping them from doing it, rather than their own internal uh, insecurities or laziness or whatever, or, or, or just lack of resources in terms of mental resources, they don't know how to get incorporated, they've never seen anybody run a business. Um, but the fact is, is that the money didn't care who owned it, and the money didn't care uh, whether it went through her old company or whether which she had nothing to do with or whether it goes through the new company which she owns money doesn't care I'm paying the same amount of money to get my apartment cleaned up every week and have my laundry done it pay change pay hasn't changed at all the money is still the same amount of money and the money goes every week to do the same thing which is to get my apartment clean but now the money doesn't go to that old company now the money goes to the new company and it goes to the new company because the excellence of the product that she put out made me go with her. I thought she was the product. I had a bunch of other people come in. I just did, they just weren't as good. So it can happen. And and the thing I like about this is when you talk about a maid or a housekeeper, it's like a janitor. It is in fact the bottom of the economic uh, barrel. But it, I, I've said this before. There's the the guy who does the office cleanup here gets here at seven o'clock in the morning he runs the parking concession for our building i mean he's in that he's in that little booth and it's 106 degrees out there 110 degrees sometimes and he is in that booth and he's um he's waving to people when they come in and he's collecting the checks for the parking concession and he's issuing the cards and he's assigning the parking spaces and he's taking care of people that are here by the hour and he works from seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock in the evening and then i guess he goes and gets some dinner but i see him here at two o'clock three o'clock in the morning and he is cleaning the toilets and he's cleaning the bathrooms. He's vacuuming this office at midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning, three. He's, he's, the daytime job is he, he runs the parking concession. That is a full-time job. And then he comes and he cleans up 
and he cleans urinals and toilets. And he is a hardworking individual, and I admire that man so much. I admire him so much. I admire him far more, far more than, than the college professors I had. I admire him far more than just about anybody I know. It's, it's magnificent what he's doing, and he's proving that it can be done. And I don't know what he's doing it for, but if he's doing it to put his kids through college or if he's doing it to buy a big house or if he's doing it because he wants a boat, or I don't care. I'm happy and proud to support uh, somebody like that. I'm enthusiastic about it. And once I realized he was coming in late at night, we started to be great friends because I, at first I thought, you know, it's kind of surly. You know, it's not like he was surly exactly. I was probably surly, but it's, you know, I want to be you know, oh, all the rigor and with the parking. I saw him here time and time again, 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, 1 in the morning, 2 He's here working, building his dream, as uh, John Condon said. Hey, another, another home run there, John. Um, yeah, he's building his dream. And you know how I know that he's working at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning? Because I'm working at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. That's why. It's just the two of us. Honest to God, we're the only two people in the building. And um, this man who's a um, lovely man, I think he's also from Mexico. He's certainly Latin, uh, Latino. He and I have more in common than I have with virtually all the white people I know, uh, where it counts, you know. Uh, it's not about the skin color. It's not about that at all. He doesn't get more money for being Latino. He doesn't get less. The money goes where the money wants to go. The money goes where it's needed, and the money doesn't care. Anyway, that's what I'm going to do the first one on. I'll do the second one on socialism, third one on capitalism, and the fourth one on uh, corporations, which I think I might just save for next um, next week, because corporations have been portrayed as so evil and just so awful, and these people do not understand that that the school that they go to is a corporation, and and, and the companies that they use to write their screeds about how bad corporations are are corporations. They sit there, and in Starbucks, which is a corporation, and they and they get on their um, iPhones, which is a corporation, and then they uh, tweet things out on Twitter, Twitter, which is a com, which is a, a corporation, using AT and T carrier signals or whatever, which is a corporation to complain about how bad corporations are, and and they don't know any better. Uh, they're idiot professors who are too stupid and too lazy to go make it on their own, and bitterly resentful, by the way, of the fact that they know. Um, all the nuances of you know of Chaucer and and uh, and and yet that that knuckle dragging Texan down the street has got a car lot and he's worth fifty million dollars and here I am a genius in you know in in, in Italian Renaissance um, uh, poetry and I'm making eighteen thousand dollars a year. Hmm. He's providing more service than you are. He's providing more service than you are. It doesn't mean he's a better person than you. It doesn't mean that he has any legal uh, opportunities than you. He should have exact same chances, should stand exactly the same before the law, and stand exactly the same in an ATM line. However, the guy that's selling cars is providing more service to other people than you are, Mr. Um, university Professor. And do you know how we know this? The reason we know that he's providing more service is because he's got more money than you do. And he didn't get more money than you'd have because the wealth fairy tapped him at night and didn't tap you he has more money than you do because he's working hard, and you're working hard too. But what he's providing is of more value to more people than what you provide. You don't have to like it. It's what it is. I have relatively little doubt that if I decided that my goal was to make as much money as I could, I could certainly find a way to make more of it than, than being an Internet pundit. Uh, but that's not my, that's not my primary uh, motivation. You know, my motivation is... Uh, is to save this country, and, and I, I'm good at this. I like telling stories, and, and I'm proud of the work I do. And this is not a high-income job for me, and it could be someplace else, but this is where I want to be. I make that sacrifice for the income because I'd rather be doing... So. I, I haven't been to work in 10 years. I haven't, got, I, haven't, I haven't had to go to work in 10 years, and, I work, and I'm here working all the time. So there's a lot to say about this, but we were, I was talking with Charlie about this, and I said, we got to make Uber. It's all got to be about Uber. They, they understand Uber so well, and they, and they love Uber, and Uber was just valued at, I don't know, was it $46 billion or $60 billion was the most recent appraisal for Uber? And, you know, if you want proof that wealth can be created out of thin air, Uber's worth $60,000 million. And what is Uber? It's an idea. It's an idea. 
Uber is an idea. It's, it genuinely, truly is. It, it, you have a little bit of resources necessary to make the app, and somebody obviously had to make the phone, but that's not your problem. It's an app. It's an idea. The genius of Uber, the genius of it, was not that they said, hey, you know what? Taxis are really um, overpriced, and they're rude, and they're slow, and they take a long time. We could outcompete the, the uh, personal transportation market. Therefore, let's go buy 400,000 cars and hire 400,000 drivers and we'll whip taxis butts because we can get them there faster. That would have been a good idea, but that's not why Uber is Uber. The genius of Uber is that Uber said there are people that need rides and there are people that have cars and time. And if we put these two things together, well, I bet that would work. You can't do that in an industrial era economy. You can't do that before this cell phone, before the smartphone. But we have the smartphone and so you can. And now Uber doesn't just drive people around. If you haven't used Uber, you may know that Uber X is you just get a regular sedan, a Prius, or a you know, Toyota, or whatever. But you can order Uber Black, which is a black limousine type car. It's a you know it's a Lincoln Town car or a Cadillac to go to events. You can order you can order Uber SUVs if you got a lot of stuff to move. And now Uber is doing things like couriers, and 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 to the undying genius of the people behind this. Uber now delivers food. The restaurant across the street from me, it's actually quite a good restaurant, it really truly is, is partnered with Uber. And that means that if I use my little Uber food app, it will show me what restaurants are in the area. And the area may be 5, 10, 20 miles from here. I'm sure I can set the area. And so if I want some food delivered because I'm too lazy or I'm too tired or I'm too sick to leave the house, then I can hit this button and they will prepare me my, you know, gnocchi with chicken and sun-dried tomatoes. And then Uber will go by and pick it up and they will deliver it to me. And the cost for the food is about the same as it used to be. And the delivery price, price is shockingly low. It's less than $10, I think. Um, so who's losing here? The, the restaurants are getting business that they never would have had because they don't have to walk in the door. People went to the restaurants and wanted good food. Just give me some. It's not you, your choices are not Domino's anymore. Domino's is very good, by the way. They've really, really gotten good pizza going. So um, yeah, so this is this is how you generate wealth out of nothing. Um, there, uh, Ohio uh, Castle, uh, Coastie says, uh, d uh, deliver uh, create Uber for air travel. I believe there is already an Uber helicopter service that they can provide helicopter service. Um, and once they figure out how to do uh, fractional jets, there's a couple of companies out there trying to do that. The uh, you know, problem with jets, you know, private jets is uh, you don't, um, you know, you don't have quite the market for that. And, but, but Uber is genius, and, and so is Airbnb. And it's an idea that one or two people had, and now it's worth $60,000 million dollars and we know it's worth that, young ladies and gentlemen, because you use it every day, right? Every single day you take a ride in an Uber and it just gets billed to your card or your parents' cards. So we know it's worth a lot of money because it's taken in a lot of money. Where did that money come from? Where did the $60,000 million that Uber is worth come from? It came out of thin air. It wasn't there before. Well, where did it come from? comes from people who have daytime jobs who are willing to work nighttime jobs for Uber and do extra work so they can get extra reward. Because here, your reward is tied into your work. We talked about that back in capitalism, remember? And off you go, you know. So the, it, once they understand the economics, I think you've pretty much got them. Um, and, and by the way, you know, I'm one of those conservatives. You hear a lot of people say I'm uh, fiscally conservative and socially liberal. I don't know if I would call myself socially liberal just because it's a such a filthy expression now but generally speaking yeah when i think about uh, the conservative principles I, I um i i believe in it's get the government out of the way let people alone let them do their jobs let them start companies like maid services or um or or transportation services and uber is especially good example for young people because you can tell them true stories about uber two of them are um i talked to a guy who was, I think that he said he was the fifth or sixth Uber driver in either in Los Angeles or California. He got in early before there were enough people of critical mass to make this thing really go. So he was, he was in early. 
And he said, this was several years ago, he said, um, because several years ago, you used to be able to be dropped off at the airport by Uber, but they couldn't pick you up. They, They were not allowed to come by and pick you up on the curb. And that's a real problem because people would take an Uber to the airport, as I would, and then you'd have to get out of the airport. And so I would take a shuttle bus to a hotel that I'd spent some money on before, and I kind of justified it by saying, well, I, you know, I pay them for parking sometimes, and I've you know, put people there. And, but basically, I'm just stealing their ride. Uh, and, um, and so that's you know, a real problem. So anyway, prior to getting the ability to pick them up, this Uber driver said that um, a few years ago, the... Um, LAX, uh, you know, whatever the airport commission is, said, tell you what, Uber, here's the deal. We will let you pick up people at LAX, but you'll have to add $10 to the fare, and the $10 comes to us, the government, you know, the the regulating authority. And Uber said, no, I don't think so. And now you get an interesting thing with with young people, because you can say, listen, let's just think about this for a second. Forget about just the airport. What if every single time you got in an Uber, you, they added $5 to the bill that didn't go to the driver, comes out of your pocket, doesn't go to the driver, it goes to somebody in Washington or Sacramento? What did they have to do with this transaction? If it's a $6 ride and, and there's a $5 tax or fee involved, now you're paying $11 what did that person do in order to get that big part of the money? And then you sit and and wait for them to answer, because there is no answer. They didn't do anything. That's why they hate Uber, which is why they blocked Uber from picking people up at the airport until finally the public demand was so high that they had to relent. And now, uh, at LAX, Uber will pick you up up on the um, departures level at certain locations, I'm not. That doesn't seem unreasonable to me. Every terminal's got a little, like a little pole outside, and it's like area F, and this is where the the um, peer-to-peer cars pick you up. Works like a charm. It takes four minutes instead of half an hour and sixty-five dollars and all the rest of it. It's brilliant. It's genius. So we gotta we gotta use the things that we, that they use to show them that corporations are actually good. It's just a group of people trying to accomplish a name, an an aim, not a name, an aim and uh, provide a service that wasn't there before for less money, and the money will go where it wants to go because money doesn't care who owns it. Uh, Let's see. I'm sorry, I just got to check here. I'm going to just skip a bunch of these, and I'm sorry if I did skip them, Uh, but some of this ground I've covered already uh, here or recently. Look at the last three here. Yeah, this is a good one. Susan Speakman, who's been here before, always has lovely questions, and here's one of them. Um, hi, Bill. Hi, Susan Speakman. It's been said that the Democrats are the party of the corrupt and the Republicans are the party of stupid. And we see this being played out every single day. Every single day after day, year after year. I don't believe the Dems will ever shed the mantle of corruption, especially if Hillary slouches to 270. Lovely expression there. Can we help the Republican Party shed the stupid moniker, or is it time for the conservative party to take over, and if so, how? Well, we could do three hours about that, and maybe we should. You know, I get the feeling that if Hillary Clinton wins in, in November, we'll be doing an awful lot of talking about what we're going to do, uh, not to change the government, but to flank the government, just to ignore this thing that's that's roaming around out there. But there's some interesting things in, in here. Um, it's true, when you say that the the Democrats are the party of the corrupt. That, that's evident on its face. And the Republicans are the party of stupid. But here's what's interesting about being the stupid party. We're, we're the party of stupid people who are much, much, much higher uh, IQ than the, than the Democrats. A lot of people say, oh, no, it's absolutely not true. More college, you know, more college professors are Democrats and more scientists are, are Democrats and all the rest of it. And that's absolutely true. I don't doubt that at all. But in terms of actual intelligence rather than intellectualism, Intelligence is the ability to see a problem, solve a problem in your head. Intelligence is the ability to spot a pattern that wasn't there before. That's actual intelligence, and we've got a lot more of it than they do. They have intellectualism. Intellectualism is intelligence that's been left in the back of the fridge for six months. So we're not the stupid party because we have stupid people. We're the stupid party because we send in our D-listers into politics. That's why we're the stupid party. 
uh, progressives put their best minds into politics. All of their efforts goes into politics. They don't have religion. They don't have uh, hobbies. They don't have jobs. Uh, everything they do is for politics. And th not only do they put their best minds into politics, but they work at it full time. The, the leaders of it do anyway. So, um, so they get their very best mind. Now, who do we get? We get um, people who could have opened businesses and didn't, and they're not, they're not our A team. Our A team is in business, and our B team is in business, and our C team is in business, and so is our D team. Um, like my business, D team business, in terms of how it's run as a business, although I have to say that has improved significantly lately. Um, in any event, we have also have families, churches, hobbies. We have, you know, vacations. We don't have to have politics in everything. We're not issuing statements on our website like President Obama did. How to sell Obamacare to your relatives over the Christmas holiday or what to say about Obamacare on the Thanksgiving table. We're not quite that disgusting. And so we want politics to go away, which leads us to our second question, Susan, and that's this. The progressives, the Democrats, send people to Washington because they want more politics. They send politicians to Washington because they want more politics. It's, it's obvious that they want more politics. They want more politics, which means that they want the government to take more money from people who don't need politics, take that money at gunpoint, put it into the government system, spread it out, give some of it to me as the progressive uh, organizer. You know, Lenin didn't go back to a coal mine after, after the revolution, and Fidel Castro is worth billions of dollars. He, he talks about communism, and he's a multi-billionaire. So th it's their way to power. But what do you do when your entire message is anti-politics? When What kind of a politician do you elect? And what kind of a political structure and ground game do you have when your entire political message is, we think politics is awful and business is much, much better? How do you find people who are ready to go to Washington in order to destroy their own power? I would do it just because I think it'd be a kick. I think it'd be a kick to destroy laws. Um, I joked about, uh, you know, my ultimate monument if I went to Congress for two years, because I would only do one term, but no reelections for me. If I went to Congress for one term, either as a senator or as a representative, I'd like to think that when I'm done, there would be a, an empty lot in a commercial district. And you've seen these before thousands of times. And it would be a series of like wooden fences, you know, wooden walls. And then in front of that would be a giant poster. And it would be one of those incredibly cool computer renderings of what the building that they're building is going to look like. And it would be a 50-story glass skyscraper. It's absolutely spectacular. And then on the bottom of the sign it would said, um, the William A. Whittle uh, Federal uh, Building has been canceled due to the vote of William A. Whittle. There will be no building here will turn it into something useful. The, 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 lack of the, the lack of the monument would be my monument. You know, that would be, that would be my monument. Would be, if you could, Robert Byrd had his name on what? I did a Robert Byrd after Burner right after he died. It was six, seven years ago now, I want to say. He had his name on something like 250 public. There's the Robert Byrd Memorial Rest Stop, there's the Robert Byrd uh, Wing of a Hospital, there's the Robert Byrd Library, there's the Robert Byrd Elementary School, Robert Byrd, all this stuff because Robert Byrd brought money from other people, taking it at gunpoint and distributed it to his voters in exchange for 52 years in the Senate. He was in the Senate for 52 years. I was about 50 years old when I did that video. So yeah, about seven years ago. And um, he'd been in the Senate longer than I've been on Earth and I've been around for a while. He, you know, he didn't forget about computers. He, when he went into the, to the Senate, there were no touch-tone phones, there was no color TV. So that's the essence of our problem, uh, Susan. We don't get our best minds into politics, and our politics are about the destruction of politics. And it's kind of hard to, to sell a nothing, you know? You can sell a, you can, you, you can put this bag out there and promote the bag, and we know what's in the bag. It's just, you know, larceny and incompetence, but it's a bag. You can wrap it up with gold foil, and you can tie ribbons on it, and there sits the bag, and you can sell the bag. But what if your product is no bag? What do you do if your product is the absence of bag? That's what you're selling. You're selling a different bag? Actually, no. We're selling the idea that the bag that 
that would be here otherwise is not here. It's a very difficult thing. It's kind of like trying to define negative space around an, uh, an art object. What are you selling? What, what, what picture are you selling? We're not selling a picture. We're just selling the frame. We're selling an empty picture frame. So I can use that later to put a picture in it? No, 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 you don't understand. The entire purpose of the frame is to be empty. That's what we're selling. We're selling a, we're selling a space where the government used to be. Well, what's going to fill this? Well, some of it won't be filled because a lot of it was just made specifically for the government to fill. So the stuff that doesn't have any use will disappear. The stuff that's important will be done by private citizens because they'll realize that since it is important, it has to be done. And since it has to be done, somebody's going to have to do it. And since somebody's going to have to do it, I could probably make some money for myself and put my kids through college and maybe take a vacation and buy a nice car or whatever by doing this thing that needs to be done. And I'll do it better than the government because somebody else is also thinking that they could be doing this thing and working together, we will drive prices down to the bottom level, not because we're cooperating, but because we both want the Cadillac. Um, so I will provide this uh, job at some, some pay level with profit built in, obviously. And then somebody's going to come along and they're going to think, how can I do this for less money? Maybe they'll provide a worse service. Maybe they're just leaner or more efficient than I am. So they're going to lower their prices. And then I'm going to have to make a decision. Am I going to go out of business or am I going to have to get smarter, faster, lighter? Am I going to have to figure out a way to give better service for less money? I mean, it's just evolution at work. It's, it's just natural selection working at very high speeds. And all it does, all competition does really is just simply, you know, it's not much really. All competition really accomplishes is providing the very best possible goods at the very lowest prices. That's essentially all competition does. And the reason you wait a long time at the government is because there's no other government you can go to. You don't open a government across the street and go over to their DMV or their post office because somebody did open a private post office. They called it FedEx, and it took off because people wanted to pay extra money to not have to wait and to get things there reliably and faster than ever before. I wish I'd uh, thought of this earlier. I'm going to take this question because I'm not going to get it again. And, and, and I'm sorry to go back to the Star Trek thing, but this one at least, at least this one is not inside baseball, okay? This isn't just the, 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 the frame of Star Trek. This is a, a question that is a great question regardless of whether you're a big Star Trek fan. Um, Matthew Lloyd asks, um, is the Star Trek transporter actually a murder machine? Is the person on the other end really you, or is it just an exact copy of you? If the transporter is just a copier, that would likely give it the highest body count of any sci-fi device. Now, this is a fascinating question that nobody thinks through. Gene Roddenberry didn't think it through. I'm sure writers have thought it through, but when you think it through, you realize, my God, we can't ever tell anybody about this because it will ruin the entire thing about a transporter. Just for giggles, the idea of the transporter, which they're actually beaming particles from one place to another, and quantum particle goes from one place to the other without going between the two. Um, so basically what the transporter is, you step onto this panel, you know, step onto this you know, um, paper plate, basically, and a, a, and a very intense beam of energy comes down and dissolves your molecules. It just turns you into dust, basically, just dissolves you into gas. But as it's breaking you down, it's studying your your composition to such a degree that not only is your brain reproduced but your actual thoughts are being reproduced this thing is so sensitive and so high information that it's able to record your brain as a series of molecules in such a way so that the memories are still intact and everything and the theory is that yes it's exactly right when you transport from here to Alpha Centauri you walk into a booth here and you are disintegrated and you arrive in Alpha Centauri now you don't see the difference obviously because your consciousness just goes, assuming this thing works, right? I step into a booth, and I wake up, I don't wake up, and I step out of another booth, and I'm four light years away. Time hasn't passed, and, you know, whatever. But did I actually make the trip? Now we get to the reason why I wanted to take this question. Did I make the trip? It depends on what me is. It depends on what your definition of is is. But in this case, it depends on what your definition of bill is. Because the answer to the question of did I make the trip to Alpha Centauri is yes and no. Uh, and it's not like in between like yes or no. It's yes and no. It's a definitive yes, I did make the journey. And it's a definitive no, I did not make the journey. What does that mean? Well, it means that when the transporter broke me down here on Earth into, in, into my independent molecules, it had to destroy me in order to record them. You see, that's what it does. It destroys the creature because when the things 
yeah, you see it appear somewhere else, but if you just stayed on the Enterprise, if you never left and never beamed down, it would be a disintegration booth. You just see people walk into the thing, sh- disappear into light and, and dust, and, and then they're just being murdered. He's exactly right. It's a murder machine. People go in there and they're disintegrated. It's like those disintegration uh, machines in that um, episode about the two planets that were at war with computers. So my material objects did not make the trip. Um, some people say that my atoms are being beamed along with it, maybe, but certainly my body as my body walked into a booth in one place and that's where it stayed. It did not come out on the booth on the other end. On the other end came uh, was assembled out of new raw materials or my matter was transported the same way with the energy, which sounds like a waste of time for me, and, um, and it's built again, but it's not me. So I did not make the trip. And at the same time, I did make the trip because my consciousness is there. And that's what counts. So the question that is, the the philosophical question is interesting, and then the the storytelling question is fatal. The philosophical question is, what am I? And nobody really gives this a great deal of thought. Well, most people don't anyway. You can can pinch yourself, like this is me, this is me, this is my physical body, true. But the cells are regenerating once every, what, seven years or something like that? That's probably a canard. But certainly your skin, you know, when, when you have a scar or forget a scar, you have a cut, you know, scratch or a scrape or something, right? And, and you've got a mark on your hand where you, where you scraped your skin off. And then it forms a scab. And then over time, the scab falls off. And then the, the, the wound heals and it just disappears. Well, the wound heals. What does that mean? What it really means is the skin underneath that has grown out and the damage has essentially fallen off with the rest of the stuff that falls off of you. So when you say this is me, no, it's not necessarily me. This is not the same. These are not the same molecules I was born with. Some of them are the same, but a lot of them are skin that I shed. We just shedding skin all the time, hair all the time. You know, all kinds of different things are constantly being renewed and recycled. So basically... Bill Whittle is not this collection of matter. Bill Whittle is the organization of the matter. He's the structure of the matter. He's not just the phosphates and the carbon and the and the iron and all the rest. He's he is that. He's the the, the carbon and the and the phosphorus and, and the calcium and all the rest of it. He's he is that. But he's also, and most importantly, he is those things structured in such a way as to make him unique individual. And every single person that's ever been born, ever will be born on this or any other planet is completely unique individual. That's mind-boggling when you think about it. Um, so the pattern is what goes. And that's what's interesting because in some level we're being transported in the real world every day. We are the cells that we were born with or the cells that we had 10 years ago are not the cells that we have today. And the cells that we'll have 10 years from now are not the cells that we have now. They'll be in the same arrangement and they'll be, um, and they'll be, as they constantly reproduce themselves, they get a little bad at it. It's not a digital reproduction. It's like taking a photocopy of something, then photocopying the photocopy, then photocopying the photocopy of the, it starts to drift. Telomeres get a little short and the information is not so reliably passed down. And that's why we get things like, uh, you know, saggy bags under our eyes and all the rest of it's a copying error but i'm the structure i'm the plan um um richard dawson who is a person i don't have a lot of respect for for a number of reasons however his work on uh, biology and on uh, genetics is superb and is really brilliant really brilliant work and he makes the interesting and compelling case that um you are not really you. The, 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 the real you is your DNA. That's what's eternal. The real you is the DNA that's passed down from generation to generation, combines with other DNA. But basically, you are just a living, walking robot that the DNA is using to continue its immortality by reproducing out in the world. It's a clever idea. But it's really true. It's a structure. And then you get into interesting things like when you start getting into the actual cosmology of um, quantum, you find out that the universe isn't made of matter. That's not what the structure is. The structure of the universe may not be the relationship of matter. The structure of the universe may be information. Uh, This is getting to be compelling evidence that the more information that 
there is available, the more complex the universe becomes because we're observers and our observing changes the outcome. Once I, once I realized that was experimentally true, then my entire theory of materialism went right out the window. Once I realized that by looking at something, you change it, physically change it. Did I say, I, I don't know who I said Hawkins, uh, Dawkins I meant. Thank you, Ohio Coast again. So the pattern's what counts, right? So did I go to Alpha Centauri? I did and I did not. My body didn't. My molecules probably didn't. If they reassembled me on the other end out of big vats of carbon and stuff, they put me back together the way I was the instant I stepped into that booth back there. Then on some very real level, I went. But, but here's where the storytelling gets interesting, and this is also where the storytelling falls apart. Because in order to have a transporter, I have to, you have to have a machine that is capable of the kind of finesse to know the location of essentially every molecule in my body and the electrical state between all of them. Otherwise, it's not me. Now, technology is technology, and we have miracles today that no one could have imagined 100 years ago, so let's say that we can do that. Let's say that we can have a, a recording system that is so sophisticated that by, by essentially disintegrating me, turning me into, a, into plasma with energy, and recording every single molecule's precise location and orientation, um, then you can transport yourself to another um, condition. However, you didn't really go. The you that was on Earth walked into a disintegration booth and was destroyed. And the vat of chemicals that's in Alpha Centauri suddenly assumes, assembles itself into something that looks like you and thinks like you, has your pattern, but it's not you. It's your consciousness even, but it's not you. You died in that booth back there. I think that's why McCoy never wanted to ride in the thing. But here's the reason why the storytelling, I keep teasing that the transporter could never, people think it through, they could never have a transporter. And the reason is this. If you have a device that is capable of breaking down somebody's molecules and recording them to the kind of fidelity so that you can recreate that person down on the planet, they walk into one room, we record the information, send the information down and reassemble the person either using their molecules or using existing molecules, whatever reassemble it on the spot then if you have the information to build a Jim Kirk because Jim Kirk went into the transporter in orbit and then Jim Kirk appeared on the surface of the planet if you've got a machine that's capable of recording every molecule of Jim Kirk and saving it in order to send it down then you realize that nobody ever dies once you've been transported then you realize that you could beam Captain Kirk down to the planet's surface. He'd walk into the transporter at the beginning of the show. The, the transporter beam would break down his atoms and record everything. They'd beam him right down into the mouth of that giant white uh, ape with a horn on its head, which kills him instantly, guts him, smashes him, eats him, does all of that stuff. Oh, my God, Kirk is dead. Kirk is dead. He's gone. The captain's dead. He's not dead. We have a, we have a, we have a print of him from the last time he transported. We'll just print another one. See, now it gets interesting. You, if, if you have a transporter, once you transport yourself, you, you don't really die. It's like a set point in a game. If you've ever played um, uh, first-person shooter games, uh, you can, if you're playing a game that, that you have to progress through, and it's a dangerous game where your character gets killed, and if you don't get killed and it's not fun because it's not challenging, you can't go back to the beginning every single time. You have to set point, like you go back to the beginning of the level, but you don't go back to the beginning of the game. So if, they, if Kirk beams down on a Tuesday... And, and Kirk is killed on a Thursday, then they can recreate a new Kirk on Thursday night, which will have all of the memories of Kirk up until the point when he disappeared. The things that happened on Wednesday are gone. That died. But everything that he was up until the moment he stepped into that booth uh, is back, and he can just beam right down again. So that's one thing. You cannot be killed if you have a transporter. There's some. There's a set point. It's 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 like a save point on a computer. We're going to save our work here. Everybody's had this experience, right? You're you're writing something complex, or you're doing Photoshop or whatever, and you save the file, and you continue to do some work, and then the computer crashes, and you've lost all of the work that you've done since the save point, and that's why it's good to save often. Same exact thing with the transporter. You've got a Jim Kirk that is as old as he is as the last time he went into that transporter, and if something happens to him, including him being blown to instant yeah, insta atoms, he, he he beams into a volcano. Okay, we'll make another James Kirk using the pattern that we used to get him just a minute ago, and we will make another one so nobody ever dies. And the other thing that nobody talks about is if you have that information, you don't 
you, not only does Jim Kirk never die because you can just make another one, you could make as many Jim Kirks as you wanted to. You could have 500,000 Jim Kirks. Instead of beaming down seven different people, what you're really beaming down in, in the story is seven different patterns, right? Seven different patterns that make up seven different individuals. You got Spock, you got McCoy, you got Kirk, and you got four guys that are going to wear red shirts and be killed to show you how the monster works. Um, but you don't have to send those seven individuals down. You can just have Kirk go down, and you can have seven of Kirk's reassembled there. So now you got seven Captain Kirk's on the planet, and they're all out there doing their thing. So, you know, and an uh, interesting question here. Uh, Dave DiNardo says, what if you print 100 Kirk's, which one is the actual Kirk? This is the essence of the philosophical discussion, because my response would be all of them are the actual Kirk. Uh, but technically speaking, the only actual Kirk was the Kirk that first walked into the transporter the first time. That individual body, when he transports for the first time, let's say he's, he's, a, let's say he's 35 years old as the captain of the Enterprise, and let's say he transports first time when he's 20, that first transporter experience is him taking his body to be disintegrated, and everything after that is stuff that could have been copied or reset or, or replayed or stored or whatever. I think it was Next Generation did a show where Scotty was in a sh was in a, a ship that was dying and, and he knew he was never going to be rescued and there wasn't enough energy for life support and he was going to be out there forever. So he basically um, transported himself and kept himself in memory and the ship just had enough energy just to keep just the memory of Scotty's platform so 50 years or 100 years later they they gas it up and and uh, and they bring it back. I thought that was brilliant. It was one of the very few times we've been talking about really understanding what the transporter is. And the replicator works the same way. Um, if you can replicate food, then you can replicate people because food is animals. You, you say I want my roast beef rare and or my Earl Grey tea hot or whatever you want to call it. Well, if you can reproduce that, then you can reproduce people too. You can reproduce anything, and um, these are called Santa Claus machines or von Neumann machines. It's a machine that can make any other kind of machine. A von Neumann machine is a film uh, is a is a machine that can create anything, and the first thing that it creates is itself. So if you've got a machine that can build anything, the first thing that machine should build is another one of it, and then that should build then two of them should build copies of it, and they reproduce literally virally. That's what viral reproduction is. Now you've got millions of machines that can produce anything, and then you can simply just build your civilization by just sending it orders. Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think I'm going to do it. I think that's done for the night. Uh, it's a longer than... Uh, it's not anything close to our marathon shows. It's, what, uh, two hours and 16 minutes, not including the, um, the uh, music coming in. But it was fun, fun to walk around and do all that other stuff. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's it. We um, we're gonna get a gonna put a Facebook post up for our mailing list. Uh, I haven't talked about that for a while. We have a mailing list here; it's absolutely free. Uh, and if you join the mailing list, first of all, we don't uh, sell your emails or give your emails to anybody. I think that'd be rather low. But if you're not on our mailing list already, we'd love to have you. And, and if you join the mailing list, which is, again, absolutely free, just an email address, then you get updates on what we're doing, and we don't flood you with these. You don't get them every day. Uh, we're, we're hoping to get one a week out just saying, here's the highlights. If you missed this, you know, here's what you got. Uh, we did, in fact, put together um, our friend um, uh, CSR Gifted there, who goes by various aliases for reasons unknown to me, but probably known to the national uh, covert security structure uh, uh, and and some other uh, valiant people put together um, the best of afterburner um, so if you want to join the mailing list you can get the best of afterburner it's I think there's 11 scripts my favorite scripts and that's a uh, electronic download and you can use it either as a PDF or put it on your Kindle or on your um, on your iBooks so we'd love to have you join the newsletter and we will um, promote that during the next couple days I suppose um, okay uh, hey funny it's funny isn't it because we're ending the story with what we with what we began it with theoretically I suppose if you could invent a von Neumann machine then you could in fact get to the place that Buckminster Fuller was talking about where in the 
just machines manufacture themselves. And if you want a car, it makes a car. And if it needs more energy, then it just manufactures more power plants. But that's not that's not um, a technological breakthrough, and it's not anything that's going to happen uh, very soon. And by the way, if you have something like that, and Buck, Mr. Fuller, if you think your goal in life is to go sit on your couch and enter school thinking what you thought when you went in, then you might as well just blow your brains out because there is nothing, nothing um, worse than being a person who can do things and doesn't do things, just sit around and literally kill time. That expression, killing time, is a great expression. I've spent a fair amount of my life killing time, but what I'm really killing is I'm killing, I'm killing myself. I'm killing opportunities to do things that will never come back. I've seen this two or three times. I close with this, I suppose. I keep always closing with something new. But um, uh, Astro Nerd here asked me what I'm going to be doing on August 21st, 2017. And I'm not 100% sure of this, but I'm 99% sure that I will be somewhat north of where I live watching the solar eclipse. That's uh, two things that I have not seen in astronomy. I've seen a lot of things in astronomy, and the two things that I have not seen that I would like to see are I'd like to see the northern lights or the southern lights, and I would like to see a total eclipse of the sun. And um, turns out that North America gets one. It gets, comes pretty much across the middle of the continent, right around the middle of the country. So it's I'm going to fly or drive there or whatever, and I'm going to watch a total eclipse because uh, that is something. The coincidence of that is we've talked before about how I don't think there would be life, uh, intelligent life on Earth without the moon. And the moon is so rare. It's uh, just the presence of the moon is in, uh, almost unbelievably unlikely. And, and for the moon to have the exact same, exact same size as the sun, uh, apparent size, it is, it is you know, many thousands of times smaller, but it's also many thousands of times closer. And it is exactly precisely the size of the sun. That's a that's a pretty big uh, roll of the dice there. Um, and, you know, if you could predict those things, you had some pretty big magic. And so that probably led to mathematics and all kinds of other things, astronomy. But yes, I'm going to watch a solar eclipse because I think it's absolutely stunning. By the way, um, this is a total solar eclipse, which means that the sun is completely blocked out. And everybody can uh, imagine or has seen partial eclipse where it looks like the moon is taking a bite out of the sun, so the moon's only taking the bottom half of the sun out or whatever. However, you can have what you would think be a total eclipse and not be a total eclipse because the, the moon not only has to be directly in front of the sun, which doesn't happen very often, but it also has to be at, at one of the closer points of its orbit because the moon, wait a minute, I'm going to think about this. It's... It must be due to the elliptical nature of the moon's orbit, which is very nearly circular. But in any event, folks, one thing I am sure of is there's a total solar eclipse, which we've all seen. The sun is gone as a black disk where the sun used to be. Whoa. And then there's the corona, and you can see all the stars in the daytime and stuff. But you also get something called an annular eclipse, because that means, yes, it's the moon's apparent size. The, moon's, the moon can be either this size, you know, or, or, or slightly smaller, that's why some moons are bigger than others. It's not why the moon looks big when it's close to the horizon. That's an optical um, issue. But the moon does get slightly larger and slightly smaller depending on when, um, where it is in its orbit. So not only does the moon have to be directly in front of the sun, the moon has to be directly in front of the sun and at its biggest because if it's at its smallest or anything in between, you don't get a total eclipse. You get a ring of fire. You get a perfect circular ring, but it's not the corona. It's, it's sun, and since it's sun, you can't see the corona. And an annual eclipse, man, that's, that's going to be a, kind of a drag compared to, you know, the, the total. So this is a total and a good, good long length of totality. I want to say it's, uh, I don't know, a minute and a half, maybe two. I think the longest theoretical eclipse is, is six minutes, five, six minutes, something like that. Um, uh, w9 uh, whiskey nine fox zulu says that rooms are already four hundred dollars a night at a flea bag in alliance nebraska uh and he went to olga lala nebraska instead so yeah as the time gets closer those rooms are going to get more expensive um i'll just i'll just uh i'll fly in and i'll sit on the on the tarmac and watch it there 
I'll, I'll, I'm, but I'm going to be there somewhere or another. Okay, well, this, uh, this wraps up episode uh, 129, which is actually 129, although I labeled it 130, and that's unusual because I just uploaded 129, uh, and there's a pretty steady stream of uploaded things there that I'll have to look at, but um, I don't know if it really matters anymore. I think I'm probably going to call this 130 because I put up 129, which came after 128, and, and so on. Um, unless I'm miscounted, which is likely, and then in which case I'll change it, and you don't care about any of this because I don't either. Uh, it's been great talking to you guys. Uh, two and a half hours later, in any event, it was a fun show. As always, and as always, thanks to our members, uh, those of you who are, um, who are uh, you know, paying uh, to keep the lights on and keep the messages coming. I say it every week because it's true. Uh, wouldn't be any office. There wouldn't be any videos. There wouldn't be any stratosphere lounge. There wouldn't be any of it. Without, uh, without those of you who um, go to the uh, BillWhittle.com website and sign up for the best Internet content there is, the best political content on the Internet, uh, it's right there, and, um, and you really should be a part of it because we'd love to have you, and uh, I think it's cool. All right, so um, I will uh, turn off the um, – I'll, I'll hit the button, Frank. Push the button, Frank, and if you don't know what that is, then there's probably no hope for you. So uh, until next time, uh, I will see you later, and uh, push the button, Frank.